Here it is. This is Tom Platts. Did how many? 23. 23 reps with 525 pounds? Five, I did 520. Nobody really knows what the weight is. They they had Tom Platts is listed at 525, and then Kaz came out and said it was fake. Wyatt out of Sacramento, California. Woo! What you gonna do? Better. Stronger. Son of a bitch. Faster. Oh, yeah. Here it is. This is Tom Platts. Did how many? 23. 23 reps with 525 pounds? Five, I did 520. Nobody really knows what the weight is. They, they had Tom Platts is listed at 525, and then Kaz came out and said it was fake. So who knows? Yeah. But I think anything over 500 is just insane for that many reps, you know? Wow. 19. 19. 20. Yeah, if you watch the forms not breaking down at all, I mean, that's the trick with it all. You know, you have to have everything balanced to do that kind of stuff. And that, to me, once I did this, you know, I went down as the, as far as I know, the only squatter that's had equip, raw, and rep records, you know. Well, then, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Chris Bell Show. Today we have a very special guest. It's my buddy of over 20 years. Yeah. I just heard you say that to Russell. Yeah. He's like, I've known this guy for like 20 years, right? Maybe longer. And I met you. Basically, on the set, there's no set really, but I call it that, on a set of Bigger, Stronger, Faster. Yeah. When we made Bigger, Stronger, Faster, um, one of my favorite things since I was like 15 years old, and I know you you too, was reading the West Side Barbell in uh, the, the articles that Louis Simmons would write in Powerlifting USA, and it's sort of what inspired me to really keep going with powerlifting and also like get deep into it. I don't think I'd ever would have gotten deep into it if I didn't find a mentor like Louis. And then obviously like that led to Mark getting into it and it led to Slingshot. And for you, it ended up having your own uh, fitness company. Is your company just called Winning? Winning Strength. Winning Strength. Yeah. You make benches that we have two of your benches mm -hmm. in here in the gym. And we also have your belt squat. Uh, belt squat machine, which is awesome. And our whole team uses like pretty much every single day. So yeah. it's really amazing to see that out of West Side Barbell came Mark Bell, Matt Winning, Dave Tate, and... Uh, we were just talking about Wendler too, yeah, right? Yeah, like Wendler. Yeah. everybody knows either their programs or your winning warmups, or we know about the slingshot or obviously Dave Tate makes every single piece of gym equipment you could possibly ever want mm -hmm. for like elite fitness systems. And this all came out of one little small gym yeah, in it's Ohio. A, it's a hell of a lineage, you know, um, that that's a big, a big factor for all of us, I think is in the early mid nineties, you know, everybody was not only looking to get stronger, but looking how to get stronger, smarter, and Louie at the time was the only guy that was really talking to us and making us ponder why we were training the way we were training and trying to figure out was there a smarter or better way to utilize your time in the gym. And I think that was the, the thing that always left my mind in the early years of everything that I read from Louie was, you know, am I not wasting my time in, in training, but is there a better way for me to figure out how to make the time in my gym give me the most benefit out of the uh, out of the time that I'm there. Absolutely. So we just watched you break a record that yeah. was long standing for like over 20 years, right? 30. 30 years. And it's uh, Tom Platts, who is the Golden Eagle, you know, Mr. Bodybuilder. He just looks like the most typical like thing you would picture if you said bodybuilder and like look it up in the dictionary it should be like tom platts right oh especially in the lower body he had like the, the flowing blonde locks yeah. and like and he just had these jack legs and yeah he had squatted um they say like 520 or 525 they didn't really know the weight right you said yeah um for 23 three reps and you did it for 24 24 yeah my, my initial goal was to get 25 how'd that feel um, fucking terrible i mean you know the thing of it is is I had tried something similar not to break Platts' record. Uh, five, six years ago, I get this text from our friend Mike O'Hearn, and he's like, "Oh yeah, hey, how many times do you think you can squat 500? I'm like, I don't know. I'm not going to try that shit. I'm a power lifter. And, but I had good conditioning. And uh, he goes, well, give it a shot and tell me how many you get. So that time, five, six years ago, I got 20. And I wasn't dying. So I knew that I, I had potential to break the record. It was just, you know, a handful more pounds and 
a handful more reps. Um, so that was just something that I was kind of not really wanting to push a new one rep max PR because once you get to the point of world records, a max PR at those weights can take six months to a year of very focused training. So I knew with the capacity that I already had, I could probably try to try to take Platts's record. Uh, but I knew I needed to do it fairly quick because I'll be 43 in a couple and weeks. And other people were trying it. Like we saw Joe Sullivan tried it. Got and 20. he got pretty close, but he had to get his uh, knee sleeves cut off because, it, like, that's how I feel all the time, too. Like, just cut them off. Yeah, yeah. I, You know, I didn't really wear anything super tight. Um, everything that I had on, which was knee sleeves from you guys, and uh, the, the the knee wrap I put around my left hip, that just kind of keeps it tight so it doesn't hurt. It just shows um, you how hard it is, though, because Joe Sullivan's a hell of a lifter. Yeah, like he's and, bent and, a bar in half before on his back, and and built way better to squat than I am. You know, yeah, I'm six foot one, so and you know that he wanted it, so you know, like he basically went till he died. Yeah, and that's that's pretty crazy. Like, yeah, that's, for sure, that's for honorable sure. too. You know, you know, I I didn't sh I didn't show it on the video because we kept that one that you saw short, uh, which had to be under a minute. But I mean, I was on the fucking ground for like fifteen twenty minutes afterwards. Couldn't move. I My mean, body was just complete rigor. I remember um, uh, we did a set. I'll never forget this, man. Like, this is when I realized, like, oh, shit, your little brother's getting strong. Mm -hmm. Is uh, we were in the gym, and we were deadlifting. And I did, like, 405 for 10, and I threw it on the ground. I go, fucking, let's see you do that, Smelly. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and he goes over, and I think he was, like, 18 or 19 years old. And he pulled it for 19 reps. And then wow. he did the same thing. He laid on his back for, like, an hour. But he was a kid. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, my God, what did you just do? And he's built better than me to deadlift, you know? Sure. He's got better leverage for it a little bit, but, like... <laughs> He still killed me. He destroyed me. He's yeah. my younger brother. He's four years younger than me. Yeah. And um, yeah, but I just remember him laying there like that on the, oh, on the ground. Mean, but that's the, that's the moment I knew. And then another thing you have in common with Smelly, which is amazing, is I heard you talk about benching 315 in ninth grade. And my brother can, did that also. Yeah. And I always tell people, like when they're, they have 315, I go, that's great. Mark did that in, in ninth grade. Yeah. Just messed it around. Yeah. But it, you, you did it also. I was like, you must have been a beast as a kid. I did, I did 250 my first bench meet when I was 13. And then um, that was an unsanctioned meet right outside the YMCA. And then the next year I did 315. Next year somewhere around 365, 375. The next year low, mid 400s. And then my senior year uh, was right under 500. And then right when I graduated high school, I won my first world championships and benched 500 as a, as a teenager. Yeah. Were you wearing shirts back no, then? No, that was raw. Because I remember um, when, <laughs> so when I used to power lift back then, um, we were wearing bench shirts and stuff, but like nobody really knew how to use them. And they were like helpful. I won't say it didn't, didn't help me at all, but instead of giving you like the 200 pounds that some of these shirts can, can give, or more. Um, you know, it's giving you like 30, 40 pounds or something because it's yeah. like too loose and you don't have it on right. And nobody, well, can help you get and nobody right. knew how to custom make them for the right size for you, the the uh, the arm angles for the chest plates were weren't a hundred percent. They were, you know, that's the thing is back in our day when they when that stuff first came out, the lifting equipment was truly designed to help protect you, not help you lift more. You know, um, the bench shirts kept your shoulder a little bit more kind of like hugged, but you didn't really notice the spring that like as the equipment evolved over the next fifteen twenty years. Um, that was kind of one of my big, well, it's interesting. Like that's the whole idea behind a slingshot is to like really protect you and keep your form good, you know? Sure. And that's, that's what it does. You know? Yeah. Because what you notice is, and what I like about the way the slingshot works is when, when you come down, if you're not skilled at lifting, the slingshot teaches you to tuck your elbow. And that's what you should do with heavier weights is not extremely tuck, but have that, that wrenching internal pressure. And you find that most people that get hurt bench pressing is because their elbows kinked out. They don't know how to tuck in and keep it on the arm. And uh, the slingshot's a great way to instruct that. Yeah. Um, and it's different for bodybuilding. So a lot of people are doing, you know, more bodybuilding where you would go lighter and you probably would flare your shoulder. As like, like Charles Glass, he wants, you to, he wants your elbows out so that yeah. you get, you know, you're really working the chest, but he wants you to use lighter weight so you don't yeah. tear and, yourself you know, up. And the thing of it is, is when you put yourself in a perfect position to lift maximal weights, it doesn't necessarily mean... Charles Glass is absolutely right. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to build more muscle. It just means you're more mechanically efficient, yeah. which is not muscle growth. So to be super strong requires muscle, but then at a certain point, knowing what you want on the bar versus how much muscle mass you want out of the exercise, 
there can be a different thought process in how you attack that form. So with Charles Glass telling you to kick your elbows out to use more chest, if you're using it as a bodybuilding exercise, that's probably right. But if you're trying to do that with 600 pounds, good luck. Yeah, you're so tear your it, it's off. the change of the goal. Yeah. Um, so I, there's a lot of weird exercises I do that it would not be mechanically efficient for strength, but they work well for hypertrophy. Um, you never want to try to JM press a bench press, you know, but I can do that for six or eight reps of 405, which Damn. is crazy. But the, you know, the thing of it is, is, you know, tucking it in and keeping it over my chest, there's another 200 pounds on the bench. Yeah. So technique and form help strength, but may not help developing muscle tissue in certain exercises because you are making more efficiency and for muscle growth to happen, you almost need inefficiency. Not dangerously, yeah. but in small tweaks. Speaking of uh, danger, you know, <laughs> uh, one of the things Mark and I just avoided like the plague coming up was like really like warming up and stretching yeah. and not necessarily stretching, but that's, that's the term I use, yeah. but like, you know, doing these like active warm ups. I'm talking about more stuff like that. And you've sort of revolutionized that you've come up with a thing called the winning warm up, which a lot of people know about winning warm ups. Like you'll just hear people just throw them out there, yeah. you know? And, um, mostly the time they're doing it wrong and they probably yeah. don't even know who you are. Like, that's, what's yeah. amazing is like a lot of people will be like, yeah, winning warm up. you know, um, another, the other day, a girl said to me, I got to do some dimmels. And I'm like, you know, about Matt, Matt Dimmel? She's she like, goes, no, that's, that's just what they're called. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, Matt Dimmel was amazing. And I started going into it, you know, and I just thought it's funny that she didn't even know who it was. Yeah. They're taking the exercise. They're utilizing with the proper verbiage, but they don't know the roots of it. They and don't know the roots. For me, for maniac. us and for Mark and everybody else, it was fun to know the roots. Yeah. You know, like I wanted to know where things came from, like demo deadlifts. And, and I wanted press, to know sorry. where JM presses hack squats, you know, from Hacker Schmidt and all these other guys to me. That's the true meaning of passion is maybe, maybe that's not why you want to train, but it, but knowing the lineage and the history behind why you do what you do is, is really interesting because you start to find that exercises that we think are new have been around for a very long time. It's just hasn't been seen in certain areas. So there's nothing new, right? I heard you talk about a person who was really close to us. And we loved it was uh, Charles Poliquin. He said, "There's nothing new in strength training, right?" Like no. he had all those books yeah. um, translate. You know, like he would translate them from different languages and all sorts of stuff. And like you said, there was all these exercises in there that yeah. you thought were special. Yeah, <laughs> right? yeah. And now you're like, "Oh, they do I that." Saw, I saw a book that Charles showed me at his house, and it was French. And obviously, I couldn't read any of it. But the pictures of the exercises, you were like, "Oh my gosh!" And the book was like from the 30s and 40s. And so you're just, yeah, you're just thinking like, oh my gosh, this book's a hundred years old and it's got these new revolutionary exercises in it that some asshole a hundred years ago thought of, you know yeah. what I mean? So next time you so, think something's original, just be like, maybe it's not. You yeah. Know? Well, you know, every, Louis got, got very famous for, um, bands. So did Dick Hartzell, the ex head strength coach from Ohio state, but he's the you, one that introduced you guys to bands. Am I correct? He, he, I remember the day he came in, we were all messing around with chains uh, Louis had Dick Hartzell come. He was from up around Akron, Cleveland area. And he's a maniac. He's a maniac. He drives this huge box of bands down, all different sizes and colors, and basically just threw them on the floor in front of Chuck and George and Louis and me. And we're all, and it was like, yeah, figure it out. We, you know, this is what we've been doing with it, but see what you come up with. Over the evolution. Now they were using them for basketball, correct? Where like they would put them like on their body and stuff and do different things. Yeah, exercises. they had platforms where they would hook the bands onto these hooks on the bottom and a platform you'd stand on. And they'd jump. Jump, good morning, squats. But where Hartzell had it, in my opinion, wrong was that he was using band tension only. What Louis and especially Halbert started to figure out was there was a fine mixture between traditional resistance and band tension that needed to happen in order for it to progress real weight training. Whereas Hartzell thought you could just train with bands. Yeah. I feel when you just train with bands, there's too much herky jerky, but when you put on the plate somehow, it makes it so it's like, it runs nice and smooth. Yeah. And then it just has a different feel. You know? And and it, and it better resembles the natural strength curve or the force velocity aspects of training. So, you know, you need a certain amount of weight per band tension in order for it to all work correctly. I remember, one day, me and Louie, I can't remember who else went with us, went up to Hartzell's jump stretch facility where he had been training these athletes, and uh, we laid down a deadlift platform that he made, and we hooked bands onto it. And what we noticed was 
the guys that train with bands only, they couldn't lift with bands and weight. They were terrible. Huh. They couldn't. We were deadlifting like 225 what, and what double the, reds. What are the bands actually doing? So the bands are um, creating, creating elastic energy. So the nice thing about bands is they don't need gravity. They're their own entity. But what bands do is they change the force velocity curve. So without getting too scientific in it, um, when you throw a baseball, you cock back, and the first six or eight inches you're getting ready to throw is when you make most of the power. And then at the very end, you're just following through. But the, the weight's already accelerated to the point that you can't really put any more force into it. So what ends up happening is if you were to hook bands or chains onto something, the weight's getting heavier and heavier and heavier at the position that it would have already accelerated where you can't create force. When that happens, you miss a portion of the lift. So if you notice like people that train with traditional weights constantly, let's just take the bench press, for example, when they come off the chest, they're going to blast off their chest the first four to six inches, and then they're going to stop and fail. And the reason is because when you train with straight weights, let's say 225 pounds is something everybody can relate to at the bottom. When it's at your chest, you have to create 250 pounds of pressure in order for 225 to move. So 225 of weight plus 225 of tension equals zero movement. It's equal. Yeah. So you have to overcome the weight. Well, so when you bench off your chest, 225 actually takes 250 pounds of force. That wouldn't be very fast, but it would move. But the problem is once it moves, now you're in inertia. And now the muscle, if it doesn't stay moving, you're going to have a big problem trying to lock it out. So free weights cause sticking points because of where the work is created. When you hook bands and chains onto the bar, the work is through the entire range of motion because it's getting heavier and heavier. So if you think of it like a car, you might want to experiment with this on the highway. Go drive on the car and put your car at the speed limit and hit the cruise control. Now imagine the engine having to work to maintain that speed while slowly applying the brakes. It's going to kick down a gear. Whoop. Yeah. It's going to keep trying to work harder and harder to maintain speed. That's what the body's doing when you hook bands and chains on. To create the same amount of force through the entire range of motion, you have to increase its capacity to push. But with free weights, that's why cars are better on gas on the highway than in the city. Because in the city, it's start and stop, start and stop. Well, for a 5,000-pound car, how, many, how much energy does it take to move it? But if it's already moving at 65 miles an hour down the highway, then it doesn't take near as much energy. It was a revelation to you that speed made you stronger, right? I, I heard you talk he, about on uh, Dave Tate's podcast where you said, then I learned about like he wanted us to get faster to be stronger. Can you explain that? Because I feel like in our gym, it's one thing that we're lacking is like there's not a lot of people in here doing a lot of speed work. And I comment on it all the time because I'm a box squat kind of speed bench kind of yeah. guy. Why is it important to be fast? And how do you get fast? Well, f quickness does not directly create power or um, strength. So the hardest part for people to understand is that you almost have to attack your goal in indirect capacities. With that being said, if you were to look at how fast your body actually creates tension. So we've been around a lot of beginners intermediate people you ever notice on a max deadlift they got a strain off the floor a couple of seconds and then it finally breaks off the floor and goes yeah. that's because the body's trying to find the most economical amount of fibers to utilize to do the lift so it's like a ramping effect okay so when you're when you're working out let's say you're trying to deadlift 250 and 250 is 100 percent your max you go to pull on it, it doesn't move it doesn't move and then all of a sudden it breaks and then it just kind of goes the body's trying to find out the exact amount of fiber that it takes to move that weight. So it's going 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70%. When you train speed work, you're telling the body to give you maximum motor unit recruitment at the fastest possible rate. And that's how you beat big fucking weights. And the biggest person to ever talk about that before Louie was Dr. Fred Hatfield, Dr. Squat. I remember Compensatory that. Accel of fucking ration. Yeah. which nobody wants to talk about now. I have a guy that was in my gym in, in college, and he trained with Fred Hatfield, and he taught me about speed bench when I was at USC, and I didn't understand what he meant because I, I was into all Louis stuff, but I wasn't fully committed to doing it. Sure. And then this guy, when I was like 19, I was at USC, and he showed me, and he's like, yeah, this is what me and Fred Hatfield do. I'm like, but why so fast? It doesn't make any sense, and it didn't make any sense to me for – Quite a while. Yeah. And then um, once I started incorporating, my strength went through the roof. Sure. Well, so think about it like like the ignition system of a car. 
when that piston comes top dead center and wants to fire the gas in the air, the faster that coil reads to that spark plug to light the gas, you're going to make more power, right? And so it's the same thing with your central nervous system. The brain, the spinal cord, and the nerves have to innervate tissue quickly and do it at a fast rate. Training speed work teaches the body to synchronize those particular motor units all in one particular point very, very quickly. If you wait and just train, say, slow strength, what ends up happening is it takes you too long to create maximum force, and by the time you get up to that point, you're already fucking tired. So that's why you get faster to get stronger is so you can turn everything on at 100% way quicker. And you usually you want to use like a lot of volume when you're doing speed work for the most part, right? Why is that? Well, you use a lot of sets. You're doing like eight to ten, eight to twelve sets, probably, right? Yeah, you do Depending. eight to twelve sets, so you can get eight to twelve singles. So instead of doing three sets of ten, let's look at it very simplistic. If you do three sets of ten of something, you've only done three singles. If you do ten sets of three, you've done ten singles. If you're trying to be strong or powerful, like a football player or a powerlifter or an Olympic lifter or something like that, or a shot putter, why do you need to be strong after 10 seconds? No. Well, it's interesting because it's different time for the squat and the bench, correct? Like it's a, what three are different reps, like three reps for a um, bench, but only two reps for a squat, right? Yeah. And that's because from what I know is you tend to slow down after that amount of reps on each lift. Yeah. Well, and it's also distance. So a squat, if you look at up and More down distance. and measure how many inches it takes to do the full lift, it's longer. So if it's longer, then it's a longer time. Gotcha. Which means that you have to shorten down the amount. So if you if your bench is um, say twenty six inches from down to up, then that would equate to you need three reps in order for it to match the amount of time. Does that make sense? What yeah. I'm saying? Could it so be distance sim- changes time? Could it be as simple as somebody like if somebody wanted to like add this in? Is it almost as simple as like just adding in a speed bench day and a speed uh, squat day in a week and then just doing some accessories after. Yes. Yeah, like so what you would do is you would do something similar to my warm up to where you have enough volume in the right muscle group areas to what we call potentiate, which is basically warm up the areas in which you think are going to be the weakest links. Then you would take the speed lift, break it into eight, 10 sets of two or three reps. And then you would do that to create as much power as you can. But where I find most You're only people, using 50 to 60%? See, I go further down than that. So that's what Louis used to talk about. But what I started to figure out with Louis's percentages, he was basing 50 or 60% because that was the only day that they didn't use equipment. So on speed day, you didn't put a bench shirt on. You didn't put knee wraps on or a squat suit. You just did speed work. And so they had to have their percentages higher because in Louie's mindset for the equipped lifting is that the maximum effort day is at least 50 to 70% equipment based, whereas the speed day is raw based. But when you train to be completely raw, which is what I got into sure. after 2013, um, what you start to realize is that it's too much muscle damage because your max day is raw and your speed day is raw. So I dropped the percentage down 10% and flourished. Wow. So I say 30 to 40% raw, 50 to 60% equipment. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. I'm going to try to uh, throw that in now. I, I like to, you know what I like about speed days is like, I'm pretty beat up. I'm 49 years old. Like everything hurts, but it doesn't really hurt to go in and do like a light squat, you know, box squats for those two reps. Like I could, yeah. I can do it no matter how bad I hurt almost like mm-hmm. that. It's, it's not easy. It's like, you know, it's treacherous territory when you get up into the higher sets, you know, it kind of kills you a little bit, but it doesn't kill you that bad. And right. so I could, I, I seem like I can always do it. So I think even if, uh, you know, even if I have some injuries I'm dealing with or whatever, I can sort of like work through them on that speed. And stuff. Basically anybody that's listening, what, what we're basically saying is you want to try to attack multiple faucets of the force velocity curve. If your force velocity curve is only, you might be able to even pull one up to show it, the type force velocity curve. But if you're only training that top point of maximal strength, you're missing massive components in the force velocity curve on getting better. And you need to get better through that entire arc. And the, the speed strength and strength speed and explosiveness down towards the other end is a lot of times where people are leaving a lot on the table as far as uh, their ability to get better. I would go to the, the one on the right. And 
not the pink, that one. So this one to give you a kind of a pretty good idea of what the force velocity curve is based on and what it should be doing. Um, so if we look at this curve, if you look at the top left, that's maximum strength. If you look at the bottom, that's mass, maximum velocity or explosiveness. So if you're training correctly, which we've tried to do for many years, maximum effort is at the top left and dynamic effort is somewhere in the middle, a little bit more to the right. So plyometrics you would want to utilize as well. That would be all the way to the right. So you in transitional or off-season type training, you would do plyometrics to the right, speed, strength, strength, speed in the middle, and then maximum strength and almost isometric point on the force curve at the top left. So if you're watching this and you see that I have said something you're not training, then you're probably leaving something on the table and not utilizing maximum uh, benefit from that curve. You know, you talked about your, your warm-ups and warming up the weak links and things like that. Um, can you explain to everybody what a winning warm-up is and why they would be beneficial and why they sort of caught on fire and a lot yeah. of people do it? Yeah, I even saw Brian Shaw use it for the last contest because um, uh, his coach Joe Ken was asking me a lot of questions yeah. about it. He was a strength coach for the Panthers. And I told him the whole scenario. I'll give you the cliff notes. So 2012, I get invited to go speak to the Sydney SWAT team and their NSCA, which was called the ASCA. And they actually put me on an advisory board for that in Australia. Long story short, I'm sitting in this. I, I had just been 600 raw, but I was still doing it on traditional Louis Simmons dynamic max effort. Didn't do a lot of warm-ups, um, things like that. And I'm sitting there listening to this lady talking about pre-fatigue and potentiation, which is two things I never used in my training, never even really thought of. And it didn't strike me at first. I wasn't like a light bulb at first. So about six or eight months later, I go do my first all raw contest, no knee sleeves, no knee wraps, belt singlet only. And I had just benched 600 raw at a, at a bench only meet. And so what I do is I go there and I end up squatting like 788. The all-time world record was 826. So I was close. I was just testing the waters to kind of see where I was at. I get to the bench press and my bench press is like 572, 578. I tried like 606 and it fucking crushed me. And so I go to the deadlift and pull somewhere around 750 and it was the it was the third highest total of all time at 308 raw. And I'm driving home and you know my initial thought process is what do I need to get stronger to get better? And that was probably the first 45 minutes or an hour driving home to kind of reassess my training philosophy. And once I started to break the initial thought processes of what we would all think is where do I need to get stronger? I started really analyzing how I felt after the squat, which was fucking destroyed because the gear keeps you tight. It gives you a lot of rebound out of the bottom, the muscles. I mean, you still have to hold it and control it and you're still tired, but it was a different level of tired taking all of that off and, and just working on raw strength. Plus, it didn't help that I didn't realize it was a walkout meet till the day I got there. So I was training on a fucking monolift and had to walk it out. Oh, Luckily, geez. I had IPF background, yeah. so it, I caught on quick and I was fine. But the point is, is that I start to realize it was a fucking conditioning problem. I was like, I'm not in shape enough to bench 600 after squatting close to world records. Mm. That was a fucking like big light bulb. What's the top raw squat now? What, like what, what mine? Yeah. 870. 870 it, wow. It's 866 or 867, but 870. Um, so I broke the world record twice in the squat after I figured out the warmups. So back to the original story where it all started, I'm driving home from this meet, hit the third highest total of all time, realize that it's a conditioning problem. And then all of a sudden the light bulb goes off about the paper the year before when I was sitting in Australia listening to other people talk before I talked, there was this PhD student that was working with rugby players and they say they saw crazy results from the lifters doing things before contest prep and they were showing huge gains doing exercises before the main lift, potentiation. And so I'm like, well, what if I, what if I do say light dumbbells for four sets of 25 and then I pick two muscle groups, lats and triceps that I feel are my weakest link. And I plug them in. I don't beat them to the ground. I just kind of warm them up in an educated fashion. So keeping in mind, I'm trying to bench 600 again in a full meat raw. I'm using 35 fucking, fucking pound dumbbells. So people think, well, Matt, what do you do to progress? It's not about progression. It's about consistency of volume. 
It's getting it warm. So I'm doing it roughly around 35, 40 pound dumbbells for the next eight months. Just benching them. Four sets of 25. So I do a 25 dumbbell press, then I do 25 lat pull downs, and then 25 tricep push downs. Now, people that are listening may ask, well, why 25? Well, I started talking to Flex Wheeler, and I was like, Flex, where did you see the most hypertrophy gain? Because I was like, okay, now I'm raw. I need more muscle tissue to do these big lifts. It's not all neurological at this point. And he goes, man, I never saw growth more than I did when I was doing sets of 20. And I was like, okay, that makes sense because 20, 25 reps is going to allow me to not go as intense. Isn't that interesting? Though? We've been pre that 8 to 12 range, right? Yeah. And Stan always says, do a set of 20. Be a, to find see out what, what a man is about. Yeah. Well, like you just saw in that squat. That's a fucking man, right? Yeah. You're squatting 500 for 24. See what a real man does. You know, oh, that's you brutal. Do, you do a set of 20, even on like a lap pull down. Yeah. You can't do much more than like 100 pounds or 150. Like you can't do a lot of weight. No. There's no so way. It forces the intensity to stay low, which is a good thing. Yeah. But it also, I knew, I started to realize that um, after four or five months, the, the density, density of my muscle was just getting fucking crazy. But it wasn't hurting my max or my speed day because it wasn't heavy enough. And so I started to plug these in. Fast forward, uh, eight months later, I go to Raw Unity, and I squat the all-time world record. Now, I've, I did not utilize winning warm-ups for the squat. I was, it was a testing ground in 2014. I used it for the bench. So I squat 832, which was roughly 50 pounds more than I did nine months prior, and I was fresh as a fucking cucumber, man. Like, awesome. Go to the bench, smack 606. Easy. I don't even remember if you were there, but your brother was. And I kill 606. I outbench Milanichev. I outbench all these dudes, and I'm only 292 pounds. So I'm killing all the super heavyweights. So at that raw unity meet of that year, I was the strongest bencher as a full meat guy. Yeah. So I, I basically have the highest subtotal in history under 300 pounds. And I start to realize, like, fuck, I need to start using these for all the lifts. So the next cycle, I plug it in on the squat. And the next, the next meet I do, my squat goes from 832 to 870. So a 50-pound jump at already yeah. the world record, that's almost unheard of. And that's when I started to realize that like, it was all conditioning this whole fucking time. So raw lifting I like a lot better than equipped because there's no masking the performance capacity of your own body. When you yeah. go into equipment, you can learn how that shirt works. You can get adjusted to what heavyweights feel like. But when it's raw, it's all fucking you. Yeah, I remember um, back when Mark was lifting equipped. It was like sort of, all, it was what was big at the time. So yeah. everybody was doing it. And I would um, put on a shirt and I could bench 455 any day of the week raw. But I put on a shirt and I, I didn't know how to use it. And there was guys at super training that bench well over 700 that couldn't even, that could only do like 405. Mm -hmm. So I hated the shirts because I never, never got used to using it. Yeah. I never got good at it. You yeah. Know? The, but, shir um, the shirts are a very finicky thing to understand. So Mark was like an expert. He got really good at it. We, yeah, I benched six. I benched six thirty five on a floor press raw when I did eight eight twenty two on the bench. Yeah. So I got one hundred and eighty pounds out of the shirt, which is pretty good. I think Mark did an eight fifty four bench. Yeah. I don't think he ever. Um, I don't think he ever hit six hundred raw. He might have been able to at that time. I think he was close. I know he, he might was have been close. able to at that time, but then his elbow got messed up, and mm -hmm. then he was never able to like really hit it. Hit it hard again. He got him beat there. What I started, <laughs> yeah. What I started to realize with the um, with the lifting was the fact that I went to a meet and I had a the world the best bench presser in the world at the time uh, asked me to come and hand out to him. And he Who was, was that uh, Rob Luando. Okay, remember him? Yeah. So Rob Luando was a. Chicago detective, he was probably 5'6", 240, you know, just a fucking NGK spark plug, right? Yeah. And I watch him warm up in the back area, and he struggles to bench 405 raw. I was like, oh, maybe he's not trying that hard. He puts a shirt on that day and benches like 950. He gets 500 and something out of a shirt. And I, <laughs> that, but driving home, that was my thought process was like, this equipped lifting's getting out of hand. Yeah, this is getting crazy. Because when George Halbert did 766 in a shirt at 230 body weight, I saw him do 625 raw, 120, 140 pounds out of a shirt. Yeah. That makes sense to me. When you're starting to bench more in a shirt by double than what you can do raw, and that's when I noticed the backlash was starting to happen. So 2010, 11, 
you started to see that people, you know, you got dudes that look like professional hot dog eaters yeah. squatting a thousand well, I pounds. I remember, like, when you lifted with a shirt, I I always felt the need to explain it to people. I'm like, well, I benched 500, but I, I wore a bench shirt. And then they're like, what's that? And, like, they don't mm. understand it. No. They don't get it. And then it's really hard to, like, be honest. I'm like, well, without a bench shirt, I can do 450 with a bench shirt. So I, I only got, like, I 50. got, like, less than 100 pounds. <laughs> yeah, on, yeah. You know, which sucked. Yeah, so it's one of those things where I started to see the writing on the wall. And uh, so 2011, I squat the all-time world record in equipment, 1197.6. And uh, that was the biggest squat ever at done at Westside Barbell at the time. And I was under super heavyweight. And uh, But after that, I, I realized it was time to switch to raw. And I was young enough to do it because I saw that the, the backlash. There was always asterisks. I'd tell people how to train. Well, that's because you're in equipment. You're in equipment. Well, that, mm. No, Louis shit only works because you're in equipment. Yeah. Well, what happens when you take it all off and you got the world records? What's the fucking excuse yeah. now? And that's what I started to realize was like, I need to appro- prove to people that what I know can work in multiple areas. I remember like people used to say about Louie, well, that's an equipment and they're all on steroids. And like, that was the excuse, yeah. you know, but then you take this, take other people and you train them in that method without steroids, and without bench shirts. And they were still really strong. So well, it's like, well, think about it in this perspective. And I'll just put it in my own personal, personal lifespan i squatted 832 bench press 574 and deadlifted 722 drug free so how old were you then 23 what's the decision to like take stuff Does well so at 24 level? i go to my first wpo semifinals in iowa uh carpenter was running the wpo the was awesome so wpo it was, was a, wa- it was fun to watch they had music they so had I, like fireworks it was, it was like the rock show of power really it, it's the way it should if it was like that now it'd be yeah. doing really well the the big be- <laughs> it the was biggest, an event if it was around now it, it'd it's be like doing an event really not just a yeah the yeah. biggest the biggest power thing one rep max that i ever can recall was when steve goggins broke the 1100 mark which had never been done before in the 2004 wpo i want to say it was 2004 and there was 35,000 fucking people in that ballroom watching Is just that the Arnold squat. So that's when we did um, Bigger, Stronger, Faster, and we filmed that. I I, I think it might have been 2004 yeah. or 2005 that we filmed. Yeah, it was somewhere around there. Regardless, I saw the very first thing that I saw when I walked into the ballroom was Becca Swanson up on stage with blood shooting out of uh-huh. her nose squatting 804. Yeah, a female. And I was like... This is the shit. This is cool. Well, and then she pulled almost 700 that and day, then, too. I, I know. <laughs> Years later, I ended up, uh, just because of circumstance, she moved to uh, Los Angeles. Yep. And she ended up being my roommate. Well, I ended up being her roommate. Oh, the nice. Place she lived in, like, a year. And it was just really cool to, like, she's, like, the strongest female, woman, like, female in the world. And yeah. she's, like, the nicest person she's, in the world, she's, too. She was unbelievable. And I, I think- told her, I said, the first time I met you, I was so intimidated. I was like... I, you know, and then she's like, yeah. "Oh yeah, you can move in with me. Like, it's, it'll be cheap. Don't worry about it." And I was like, "Oh my god! Like, I'm gonna really like." Th- I was yeah. really afraid of her. And then she ends up being like the nicest, sweetest mm-hmm. person in the world. You find that a lot. A lot of the, a lot of the people that are the most elite in the world at something, or they they've had, especially if, like for Becca or me or yeah. Mark, that's had to work so hard to get there. Um, you realize the struggles that everybody else has too. An interesting thing about Becca, I'd ask her about her training and stuff, and like. It was really interesting because she was such an athlete that she just did what her coach told her. So I'd like ask her these specific questions about why she did it, why Didn't she not. That's what Rick, Rick gave Hussie, me to yeah. do. And, and H- I'm Hussie, like, that's kind of great though, because you're just following this yeah. like, path. You know? Hussey, in my opinion, at that time was at parallel and at sometimes even better than Louie as a coach. Yeah. Uh, just from what I heard the other guys say, and I'll tell you this, I'd go to the big world contest once I got good enough when Hussey was – not sick yet, but he was yeah. not going to be around Hussey, much longer. He owned, uh, big Iron, big Iron yeah. in Nebraska. And every meet I ever did, he's like, he'd come up to me and go, he'd, he'd fill you with so much confidence. Now, keep in mind, I'm on Louie's team. I'm not lifting for Big Iron. And he'd come up to me and go, you're the strongest motherfucker in this place, dude. Like, these weights are nothing to you. And he would tell me that before I'd walk up. Louie never did that to me. So I remember that, like, crystal clear. Like, Hussey used positive reinforcement to get people better, and Louie did not. Yeah. You know that. Yeah. So it was one of those things where Hussey believed in me and sometimes more than Louie did, and uh, it was an interesting— Did Louie ever really believe in anybody? I don't think so. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I remember I remember watching Chuck break an all-time world record again. He had like 12 all-time world records in the squat, 
And I don't remember Louie ever walking away looking happier. Or, he was always the next number. He could never be, he could never even enjoy what was happening for a minute. It was always the next thing. It was never now. And that, I think that hurt him in some ways and hurt a lot of his relationships. Yeah. Sounds I, like Belichick in the NFL, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. You know. Well, I, I think Louis Simmons is one of the like, greatest people to walk the face of the earth as far as strength training goes. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, he had a lot of flaws like that where he wasn't um, very personable to a lot of people. Um, I remember, like, like Mark, when Mark lived out in Columbus, he went to breakfast with Louis every day. Yeah. I'm like, how do you get to do that? He's like, nobody else wants to. Like mm -hmm. everybody else is sick of him, you know. Like, <laughs> yeah. and it, and it, but Mark's like, I use it as an advantage to like to be able to be close to him and to learn, be able to like learn, yeah, yeah. And he the breakfasts is when the Bob real Evans. deep talk happened, and I'll tell you why a lot of guys didn't like to be over there with him for breakfast. It's really easy to understand. Louis at some points of Westside Barbell was the only cognitive person trying to really think outside the box, you know, because once Dave Tate and Windler left. There was only me and Stafford left that were educated and pushing hard. And so I remember it was a lot of times it was me, Stafford, and uh, and John Stafford, by his own right, was an amazing lifter, 2,500 pound total at 275. But he, we were the ones sitting around talking about the Soviet techs, percentages, intensities, volumes, things of that nature. And a lot of the other guys were just there to be like a Becca Swanson. I don't give a fuck about any of this. I just want to be as strong as I fucking give can. Give me the program. Let's go. Exactly. So that's why guys got sick of Louie, because Louie wanted to understand that the entire 360-degree process versus just the training. Yeah. Always looking for the... He was a mastermind with, like, he knew everybody's numbers. Mm -hmm. Like, Danny Blankenship back in 1972, bench five... Like he, got, he just found out, like, all these numbers. Yeah. And Mark and I was like... All this. Like he remembers exactly yeah. what this guy benched, what this guy squatted. From, or... from being around him for as many years as I was, which was probably one of the longer tenures, I was there from 99 to 08, so nearly 10 years. Um, what I started to realize was if Louis these days would be called autistic yeah, or have a, a learning disability, Did... insanely smart in one area, but almost socially so awkward that he wouldn't survive in the normal working force. Does that make sense yeah. what I'm saying? Did did Louis invent the conjugate system? Is no. That, or is so, it something that he picked up? It's something he picked up from A.S. Mevdiev, Verkashansky, and Zatsiorsky. So I'll give this is a pretty cool Whoa. story. <laughs> wow. So yeah, so um and why I know this is not only because I read, but you'll see here in a sec. So I'm driving over to Columbus from Indiana, two and a half hour drive one way to squat as many times squat and bench as many times as I could. So a lot of people don't understand that, first of all. This is interesting. Spent two and a half hours to go no train with the best people in the world. And um, and when Mark lived out there, he, you know, he lived in uh, Louisville and he would drop or he lived in Columbus so he could train with you guys. And he had to go to wrestling school twice a week. So he drove to wrestling school to, to Louisville because five days a week he wanted to be by Louie, uh -huh. you know, and, and I think like people don't make those sacrifices anymore. To drive two hours, but go ahead. No. Sorry, no, it's fine, and that, that's a great point. So we, I'd get up, um, I'd get up on Friday, go to class, work a little bit in the weight room with Wade at Ball State. Hop in my Wade would let me leave early around one thirty. I would drive all the way to Columbus, get there by five, um, so about a half an hour early in case traffic was bad or something. Um, talk with Louie for a couple of minutes. We would squat our fucking ass off. And probably do some and, kind and of. And nobody a, you're training with remembers that you came two and a half hours either. So you're just. You're nor do just, they care. Yeah, they don't care. <laughs> they don't give a shit. No, because most of <laughs> them gotta, are. There's, you know. You got to lift just as hard as when them. When you walked into that gym, you realized it was like getting prepping for war. I remember the biggest advantage I ever had coming from Westside Barbell is the fucking training sessions were worse than contests. So when you went to the contest, you're like, eh, whatever. Yeah. Because you're used to seeing those numbers and that kind of weight on the bar every fucking week. It's almost like a desensitization of understanding what those weights are and what they do. Yeah, I because remember Dave Tate saying he was burnt out by the time he was like 20. Yeah. He was everything yeah. hurt on his body by the time he so was 20. So I would drive over there and squat. Then me and Louie would grab dinner, and then he'd let me stay at his house. And then I'd get up in the morning and bench with George and drive home. Um, and I was home by noon the next day. And then I would go back to work or whatever. I was either working at the hospital or back at the weight room again. Um, and doing those trips um, – you started to realize how special this situation was. But I remember the first six or eight months I was doing that, I'd come back and 
I'm talking to Dr. Kramer about, dude, you should see all this fucking crazy shit we're doing. We're doing this max effort work. We're changing the exercises every week. Everybody's getting stronger. Nobody's getting hurt. We're doing this other day where it's all speed work, where we're trying to get faster and then trying to not knowing nearly what I know now, trying to explain to the best researcher in the world the fucking force velocity curve, and he's snickering at me. And I'm like, what the fuck's so funny, man? This guy is so in, in innovative. You know, Louie, he hands me Science and Practices of Strength Training by Zatsy Horsky, shows me the force velocity curve and the methods of training, and then I look at the research articles, and it's from 1963 from the Soviet Union. And I'm like, we didn't invent this. Yeah. This is from the Soviets. So without going into too much history, I'll explain to where conjugate came out. So in the early 1900s, the Soviets decided – that it was going to be the most beneficial to them to win the most gold medals possible. So what they did was is they looked at all the sports in the Olympics, and they said, well, shit, 60%, 80% of these sports are anaerobic. Let's throw all of our science and all of our physicians and all of our physicists, let's throw them into figuring out anaerobic sports. So by the 50s and 60s, just in St. Petersburg alone, you had over 1,000 researchers so imagine having a thousand Dr. Kramers sitting in here in super training, designing everybody's training. That's what they had. Yeah. And they started to figure out not only did they have hundreds, if not thousands of athletes, they had dozens and dozens and dozens and hundreds of researchers in different areas trying to figure out the most optimal way to train. And that's why the Soviets were so far ahead. So I give Louie all the credit in the world for bringing it to the West. Louis was just smart enough to open up a fucking book and start studying things that were out of Western realm. Yeah. You know, but it was available to everybody. But again, who's the guy going to pick it up and actually do it? And that's where Louis was still young enough when he got those books to experiment a little on himself. But he had a gym of badasses to play around with for 20 years to figure out what he thought was the best avenue to get those methods to shine the most. Do you still use that style of programming? Absolutely. I just put the potentiation warm ups, the winning warm ups beforehand and I'm very calculated on recovery and total monthly volume which Louie would write about but in the gym was out the window yeah and and, and again you know you would blame he it a little a bit about GPP what general physical preparedness and he would say like <laughs> just pull a sled get in shape a little bit don't be so fat you know like he yeah. had a lot of that stuff going on which was he had it going on but I think that was his biggest one of his biggest issues was he couldn't figure out how to balance optimization with overtraining. What's interesting to me is how many things have come out of West Side Barbell. Like even just pulling a sled. You guys didn't invent it, but you made it pop. You oh, know, absolutely. Like all these just little little different things that have come chains out of were there. never really used. Bands were figured out at West Side Barbell. Yeah. Um, you know, the sleds were important. A reverse hyper machine. N- like reverse hyper. They're in every gym now. They're yeah, everywhere. reverse hyper was popularized in America, although again wasn't invented by Louis. You look at some old, I want to say Danish or um, somebody else had something. Norway like or something. I actually Ed Cohen showed me the magazine from the sixties and flipped it to a page and it was a article on a they didn't call it that because I couldn't read it. It was some foreign language and it was the exact reverse hyper. Yeah. But Louis made the first patent for it in the US. So with that being said, um, he was very good at finding things that were had been done in the past, regenerating them and making them new in America. So, what was your break off point aside? Like, why did you leave? Uh, recovery, <laughs> actually, is pretty interesting. So, um, I'm trying to think of where to start. So, I go to this meet and I had just squatted um, about a thousand. It was, it was 1,025 or 1,030. So I go, to a, I, I go to my one meet, and I squat 1,003 in 2006. 2007, I, I jump close to 1050. But I am fucking beat up. And I'm showing my system of training to Verkashansky. Verkashansky was in charge of all Olympic sports in Italy. He's the godfather of plyometrics. He is the, one of the original innovators of the conjugate system. We can go into that story, too, about how it all came to be, but the Soviet Union, how he figured out how to cross-train. And I'm showing him what we're doing, and he goes, where's your deloads? And I said, what? And he goes, you guys are at a, such a high percentage of neurological strain, you're not giving your body a chance to absorb the training. Why don't you try what we did, which is go hard, pretty fucking crazy, stupid, one week down, and then build it up again, wave it. Yeah. Right? I mean, very simple. 
And I'm like, so you're telling me that we're we're starting to hit a wall because we're not recovering? And Verkashansky was like, absolutely. There's like, no Louie would wave things from like fifty, then like fifty five, and then sixty percent, maybe like over three weeks. But then you'd go right back down to fifty. So you're saying go like fifty, fifty five, sixty. Well, you maintain speed down. work volume. What he was talking about because we were powerlifters was dropping the max effort day. The max effort day. Okay. So you're I thinking you. the speed day. Yeah. So max effort day for Louis was one hundred percent. So it never waved on max effort. No, day. it was always just whatever the rep range and exercise was. It was one hundred percent. So it's every couple of weeks you drop back down. So what I did was, and I said, Louis, let me experiment with this and see if it works. So what I did was I go um, 90% week one, 92% week two, 94, 95, not over 100, 94, 95% week three, and then drop it down to 70% and work on technique and then start that over again with a different implement. And uh, for the athlete, those deload weeks are probably nice, like a nice, like, uh, it's not that hard. They are. But what you start to find is that actually I got sick every deload because my body was going, hey, this motherfucker's in war. We don't have time to get mm. sick. And then when you finally give your body a break, it all that comes pummeling in, which you start realizing that we were training too high of an intensity. So when I build that, so what I did was is after the first six or eight cycles, I dropped it down to 88%. And I went 88, 90, 92, and then a deload. And what I started to figure out was is the more I dropped my percentages back, the better I got at contests. But Louie would get mad because every day was a competition in the weight room. I started to realize, and me and Louie would have discussions, nearly arguments, what the fuck does it matter what we do at the gym if we can't replicate it in the meets? That should be the point. It'd be like Usain Bolt has a nine-second flat 100-meter dash right. in training, but he goes, he goes to the Olympics and runs a 10 seconds. His coach should be fired. That's what I was wondering. How did he deal with you wanting to modify his system? Terribly. Well, this, is, this is where we get at. That's, that's where Mark broke off from. Well, that's why I can't I've, modify my system. I know I've heard yeah. that before yeah. about Louis, and which I is, wanted to get your kind which of take is on conjugate that. in of itself is modification of systems in order to elicit a greater response with less effort. Yeah, Mark and Jesse so Burdick were right in the. Will you fucking look at the system? CrossFit, and he was Mark was mod Mark and Jesse were modifying it for CrossFit, and then uh, Louis didn't like it. that. Oh. Was sort of the breaking point, point. and it's really a shame because like, still even to this day, God rest his soul, Louis's not around anymore, but. Like, I still love that guy. Like, oh, I, yeah. I, I just love how passionate he was about it. Like, he was never, like, I knew him very little, but he was never well, a dick to me. So no. I always really well, loved him. Well, and you were only there ever part time. Yeah, just, just that's saying. The, that's what I, made Louis' aura so odd is that people that were around him occasionally loved him. thought he was fucking Jesus. Yeah, and the people yeah, that were around him all the time started to realize there was a fucking problem. Yeah. I could see the flaws, but so, I still just. Love that. So let's go into application. So I, so Louis like, ah, fuck, whatever, fine. You, that's why you want to do it. Fucking do it. Because at that time, I was the fifth best in the world. It's not like I'm talking out my ass and I'm just some kid out of college. Like I'm a 2,500 pound totaler. So there's me, Greg, and Harrington and Vlad, all in the same fucking group that are doing all insane things. But Vlad and Greg and them want to listen to me because they're like, well, Chuck at that point was gone. He had left. Him and Louie had a huge fallout. Chuck was down on the south end of town. I had the PM, I had the AM group. So this is my fucking, my ropes. And so Louie lets me do it. Well, six, eight weeks later, we all follow that system. We all go to the meet. Greg breaks his second world record. Vlad becomes the 1,250-pound squatter. And then I go from number five in the world to number three in one meet. Wow. So we're talking fucking like stride jumps. And you think... Louie would be insanely happy about the situation. And all this is in the documentary, uh, West Side versus the World. You yeah. can see the whole story if you want to watch it. Where's that, great, where can we find that documentary? That's, it's on Netflix, or it yeah. was on Netflix. It's a really, you know what's funny is like they were making that movie, and I was just thinking like, because most people don't do good jobs making documentaries. Yeah. I'm like, this is going to be a little. And especially in the bodybuilding fitness world. Yep. I, I was really, really surprised at how good it was. It came out great. Like I said, the only only thing I have to bitch about the documentary is at the end, instead of showing Louis some old man wants to die in a gym, they should have showed the coaching lineage. Because you need to be like, oh my God. Yeah, what came out of it? You'd have me, yeah. Mark, Windler, Tate. Such a, such a better take. Huge take, and it's it a creates take. a positive light on all yeah. the work. Yeah, that, what, what did this guy do? It's not like, even that I give a shit. Even if he wanted to keep me out of it, I don't care. But right. at least show, at least show Elite FTS and Mark Bell and all the other guys that really kind of changed the lifting world scene forever. And all of it started from Louie. Um, so without that being said. Well, even, even like super training, right? That was Mel Sif's book. Yeah. And um, I remember like um, Mark went to some seminar 
I think he like got a book from him or something. And um, I remember like that was the most important thing in the world to Mark. And that was mm-hmm. something that came from Louie. Like, hey, go see So you know the, the co-author Sith. on that is Verkashansky. Okay, that makes sense. Well, Verkashansky is so, the guy I'm talking to in Italy. It's funny because Mark and I had a conversation. Yeah. He's like, I don't know what to call my gym and you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, super training. Sounds fucking awesome. It sounds like Superman. Like, yeah. super training. And then he goes, yeah, but that's a book. And the guy wrote the book and everybody's going to get mad at me. I'm like, no, it's an homage the, to like the Well, not only book. that, n- only the real people know that book. Yeah. yeah <laughs> it's yeah. not like it's And the, that's what we find is more yeah. people know super training gym than know super training the book. Which is crazy so cool. in theory. Yeah, which yeah. is awesome for, for, for all us. of us. Yeah. But the big thing is, is like um, a lot of that highest level knowledge is back. So back to that story. We all go to the meets and we all do better. But you're thinking Louis is going to be like, all right, man, we're on to something new. He was pissed because it wasn't his way. And then the final breaking point is um, my bench is stuck at right around 722. And I can't figure out how to. Stuck, which sounds crazy. It's stuck at 722. That's terrible. But, you're, you're amazing, by the way. But all, yeah, all these lifts <laughs> are climbing, amazing. but the bench is <laughs> these fucking. These are just mind blowing. Yeah, the bench is stuck. So I go see um, uh, Bill Crawford. Remember the big bench guy back in yeah. the day? He knew how to use a shirt like you wouldn't believe. He was one of the first guys to bench 800. So he's holding this seminar in Detroit at Detroit Barbell with Clay uh, Brandenburg and all them guys. And I'm like, I got to go up and see what this fucking guy's talking about. So Louie was a big component of taking the weights out, tucking the elbows right off the rip, and then kind of rolling and pressing. Well, so Crawford's like, you're not built to do that. You need to flare out, then tuck in the last two, three inches. And then right when the, you hear the press command, kick the elbow out and let the shirt just pop you back up to the top. He teaches me this, and in about eight weeks, my bench goes to 800. I mean, fucking unbelievable. And so I, I bring this back, and Greg's all excited because I beat him to six. I beat him to 800. I'm, now I'm the strongest bencher. So J.L. Holdsworth was the best bencher as a three-lift guy at that time with 775. I just did 815. So now I'm the best bencher of a three-lift guy ever at Westside Barbell at the time. You think Louie would be happy about that, too. It's not happy about it at all. So what I'm trying to do is do what Louie did in the old days, which was go find better information, bring it back for the collective unit to get better. And instead, it was creating animosity. Although I all, I, all I saw was if Louie truly only cares about numbers, then what the fuck's the problem? And so it all comes to a head. I go to that meet. I bench 800. Now I'm the king dingling of the three lift guys. I'm finally earning my legend spot at Westside Barbell, and um, we're training for a next the next contest. And my idea at this point was do to to uh, manipulate those variables. Was I was talking to Verkashansky and Zatsiorski, and I was he was like, well, since you guys do equipment, why don't you do a raw week, then a moderate equipment week, and then a full equipment week? So that way you maintain hypertrophy, but you're changing the environments. So it would be kind of like you get really good at driving a drag car one week, the next week NASCAR, the next week Formula One. And as over time, you master all three of those, game over. So we're changing the car that we're racing. It's different feel, different miles per hour, different turning cap- capacities, whatever. So I'm looking at it as, okay, law of accommodation. We've maxed our capacity and gear. We need to go back to the basics. and We need to do raw briefs, full gear. So the second cycle of doing that, I do seven, seven seventy five and five chain with a belt. It's a nine seventy five raw fucking squat. And Louie is the entire fucking workout running the monolift in the corner at the gym, going, I don't know why the fuck you guys don't have any gear on. This is bullshit. Blah blah blah. And I'm all fucking juice the fuck out, man. And I am I'm the one of the best in the world. And Greg had just broke records under my shit. And Vlad had just hit the all time world record in a squat under basically what I was designing. And I was like, and that this is where I feel bad. I was like, listen here, motherfucker. If you want to talk about how we're going to train, then let's do it after we work out. But I'm not going to listen to you bitching and complaining when I'm getting ready to put more on my back than you ever squatted with no fucking equipment on. You know, I mean, so I'm pissed because yeah. I'm like, it'd be like you getting ready for your top set. And then I'm over there telling you nothing you're doing is working and you fucking yeah. suck. What are you going to do? It's hard to train like that. So, yeah, it's I'm impossible. like, if you want to just come in here and bitch and complain, then go wait in the fucking office and we can talk when we're done training. But I, at, my, at that point, I felt like I had already earned the right to decide what we were going to do because he'd have never done that to Chuck. Yeah. Right. And he, but I felt like I was already on that playing field because all the guys in my lifting crew were all getting better from what I was designing. And it all was based on deloading and understanding 
environmental ad- adaptation changes. And so he kind of laughs it off because he knows he's got me pissed, but deep down he's fucking mad. So the next morning I come in and George walks into my office. I had an office at West Suburban on the other side. And he goes, he goes, dude, just get a hold of me later. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he just walks out. Not 10 minutes later, Louie walks in. He goes, man, I just don't think you're going to work out here. You know, blah, blah, blah. And I just get fucking pissed. I'm like, so everybody's doing better on what I'm so telling them to how do. how many years of being there? 10. I'm like, we've well, known each other. It's going to work out. We've known oh. each other 10 years. I moved all the way from Indiana, turning down pretty big jobs with a master's degree just to come over here to train. And now you want to throw me out because we have a disagreement on how to train. Now, I felt that that was warranted if everybody was getting worse. But if everybody's getting better and the, the, true, the true goal is performance enhancement, why the fuck does it matter? So you started your own gym. So not at first. So I'm kicked out, and now I'm just deciding what my future is going to be. I'm, I mean, I've been Planet lifting fitness. my ass off forever. <laughs> it got, all it got me was my, my mentor shit? fucking hating my guts, yeah. basically telling oh, me I'm a crazy. fucking idiot. Oh my god! I'm in. I have hardly any money because I had just moved over from getting my master's degree out of school. I'm still in debt from school, and this fucker just throws me on my ass. Now keep in mind, I'm still training people at Westside Barbell too. So now I can't do any of that. I got to find someplace else to go train all my clients. I, I, my whole life's turned upside down and I'm just out of graduate school. And so I finally Plus, about it's it, all your friends too, right? And it's like all my friends. Training. So now I can't really hang out with Greg. Yeah. I can't really hang out with Vlad. Keeping in mind a month later, Vlad blows his fucking knees off training like an idiot. So, um, so I finally, after a day or two of basically being depressed, I just get a hold of Chuck and I'm like, Hey Chuck, you know, um, I know you're down in Grove city. Uh, Louie just threw me out. And, uh, I, you know, I don't know what the fuck's going on. We were all getting better, and he just gets mad. He goes, fuck him, and come down and train with me. So now I got another opening. So I go talk to Danny Dig and Chuck, and Danny's like, well, let's bring your clients here. I'll charge you. And for people that don't know, Chuck Vogelpool is probably the most intense power lifter to ever walk the face of the earth. Yeah, 12 world records, uh, career lasting more than 15 years. Uh, he was the first man to squat 1,000 pounds at 220. He's like the Stone Cold Steve Austin of power. Like he's yeah. so like intense. Yeah. You know, like you're just scared of him. Yeah, he's just fucking. He's in bigger, stronger, faster. He says one sentence. Yeah. As a kid, you always want to be the strongest. You know, I still want to be the strongest guy. Yeah. And that's like all that's he says. That's it. <laughs> I, I'm, just, I'm just sort of fascinated by your mentor is disappointed in you. And because kind of you're clearly, when you said you had a master's degree, I was like, Oh, that makes sense. Like just listening yeah. to you talk, your intelligence, you're not, you're not braggadocious about your intelligence, but I, I see it coming from you. Yeah. And, and this man that you've been there for 10 years, your mentor, the guy that's right. coached you, how do you deal with, how do you deal with his scolding and him casting you aside emotionally? It's brutal because I've seen him do it to other people, but I'm thinking that I'm smart enough and strong enough. He's not going to do it to me wrong. So he kicks me out. I go down, I start to train with Chuck and Chuck's like, look, I know whatever you're doing is fucking working amazing. And I want to help you. I want, I want to help you be the best you can be. Now, remember this. Nobody has ever talked to Chuck like this. Chuck's usually like, you're going to do it the way I want it done. And if you're not going to train the way I want to train, you're not training around me. That's how Chuck was. But for me, he started to see that I had some level of knowledge that he wasn't ever used to. He's like, so here's what we're going to do. You squat with me. You deadlift with me. And then you, I bench with you. Because my bench was fucking insane. And he's like, let's see what happens. I got him back up to a 500-pound raw bench after breaking his neck. He hadn't done that in 15 years. So he was like, what the fuck? I mean, I, I just made Chuck Vogelpool like 50 pounds stronger in the bench with a broken neck. And so now he's like, let's try playing with what you're doing with the squats and deadlifts. Fast forward six months later, as you can see in the West Side versus the World, I show up at Louis Simmons' own meet with his own money, and I break the all-time world record and get best lifter. <laughs> And that was when Louis really got fucking mad because now on a world stage in Powerlifting USA, without it being said, he has to hand me $10,000 of his own money in front of the entire fucking Powerlifting world. And the people that knew, knew that I was right. Right. And it was awesome for me at first, but what I did is I poured salt on an open wound because he was still pissed at me. And... So when he handed me the money, obviously nobody else could hear because you know how loud it is at those contests. Yeah. He hands me the money and everybody's clapping. And I said, I told you I was smarter than you, motherfucker. <laughs> that's what I told him because now I'm pissed. And yeah. now I just proved it again. Yeah. So 
fast forward to the next year, we keep everything real quiet. We're not showing anybody really what we're doing. I go back, and now I'm the one of the first lifters to squat 1,100 and then bench 800 and then hit the hit the all time world record again. I, I mean, like talking like now you're just now you're just taking the wound, cutting it open more, and pouring more salt on it. And so at that point, Louie and I were like arch enemies. We'd run into each other at restaurants every once in a great while, and he'd be like, "Hey, how's it going?" and shake my hand. But I could tell he he didn't want to be that nice to me anymore. And uh, that was a weird situation, but that was the growth point I needed to start my own gym. And then uh, What's I started. Your gym called? It's called Ludus Magnus. It'll be it eventually just be called Winning Strength Depot uh, when we move uh, areas What's the eventually. Name? Uh, it means elite training grounds from that's that's the training grounds that the Romans had that's next so to the Colosseum. Cool. So, so, cool. so if you go to Rome and you go to the Colosseum, right next to it is a big ruins where they all trained for seven hundred years to fight in the gladiators. So I was like, that's fucking awesome. I had a buddy that was Greek. Yeah. And he goes, Why don't you just call it Ludus Magnus? I'm like, what the fuck does that mean? Like you just did. Yeah. He's like, dude, it means well, elite. I, I know what it means. Yeah. But I, I asked you yeah, because but, I wanted you to tell everybody. Yeah, so, I think it's cool. so he's like, dude, the, the best the, some of the best athletes in the world trained there for seven hundred years. I was like, oh, that's perfect. Oh. Yeah. So we, we called it that. And, uh, but what I started to realize being around Louie all the time is I knew I didn't want 20 of me. And not me personally. 20 of me would have been amazing. I didn't want 20 Phil Harringtons, or I didn't want guys that I felt like were just there for them. So at that so your time. your a little different, though, than Westside. Westside was like a free gym, right, just open mm -hmm. to the public. What's yours? My like? gym focuses mostly on police, fire, or military. I get a lot of guys ready for special ops selection. I get a lot of guys ready to go into the fire service. I get a lot of guys that are older staying in the fire service. I got three or four guys that are over 65 that still deadlift over 400 and just retired from the fire department. And you also you also go to fire departments and police departments and yeah. train. So the, initially, also. the gym, I had one fire department, and they took a risk on me. They were like, we got a lot of injuries up here. We're, we're getting hurt taking overweight people to the hospital do you think strength training will help? And I'm like, I think I can make a difference. And I had a little bit of back back behind me because I'd already been doing contracts with 3rd Battalion Rangers, and I dropped their injury rates down 30%, just training them smarter. Don't get me wrong. It was nothing magic I was doing. I was just replacing a lot of stupid shit with reverse hypers, GHRs, and then proper squat mechanics. And then I told them to lower their running down 30% because they were getting too many shin splints and impact injuries. Well, they were doing all this dumb shit with lifting. And then they were running them like they were fucking marathon runners every week. I'm like, something's going to give, let's yeah. change it this way. And the, the general was like, man, I'm, it's risky, but I'll do it. He does it in one year. Injury rates go down 33%, but their average score over the entire um, battalion went up. So they got fitter and did less work, which is the whole point yeah. of fucking periodization and understanding yeah. how to train. And I had a conversation with him. I'm like, Oh, the guys must love it. You're like, well, some of them do. <laughs> it's just like anything else. Yeah, some of them love it. Well, some of them are just. And I had a I had a weird I had a weird experience because I started experimenting with conjugate system, Louis style, the Russian style. I outside of powerlifting, my first experience was training special ops. Well, here's the thing: those guys, when they come to me, they have to fucking do what I tell them. When their leader says you're doing what winning tells you to do, mm -hmm. or you're in deep fucking shit. They don't. They are used to being robots. They know how to follow. What do how I need to do? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No, sir. I mean, no, sir. they know how to how, follow. How does it work yeah. for soldiers? Good. Amazing. Good. Amazing. So, and you can look up the Muscle and Fitness magazine where it calls the program the best in the world ever designed, which is fucking Congratulations. awesome. Congratulations. Yeah. yeah, which is cool. <laughs> so, um, long story short, um, they implement it. The injury rate drops thirty percent. The fire chief from Dublin sees the magazine and sees that I'm in local. And then I'm doing all this with Ranger Special Ops and ask me if could could you think you could help me? We have a horrible insurance problem up here, you know. And uh, so I go up and I'm like, yeah, I think we can do we can make this work. Fast forward 12, 15 years later, their insurance premiums went from 600,000 to under 100,000. And they and they got older. So it's not like we got a bunch of new guys in and the old guys left that were injured. We just started training them smarter. So when I got there, the average deadlift was a about a, a little bit under 200, and now the average is 400. So they're twice as strong, which, you know, a 400-pound deadlift, I'm not saying is insane, but to have 130 guys do it that started at 185 with no injuries, try that shit. Yeah, you know, a 400-pound deadlift is actually, our world doesn't mean much, but, but in, to the the average real, world in the real serious. world, it's 
It's upper percentile. Most people can't do it. Uh, do you mind if I ask, Chris, do you mind if sure. I ask a question? Go ahead. You know, I, I'm hearing you talk about just the elite athletes, even, I mean, even military service personnel, they are, they are athletic people. What about people on the other side of the spectrum? Like, I mean, it, I, I'm, I'm kind of a fatty. I don't know uh -huh. if you've noticed or not, but uh, Chris and Mark are helping me lose some weight. I've lost yeah. about 60 pounds and I've never lifted weights more than just a little bit in high school football here and there, 24 hour fitness. Where does the deadlift rank for a guy or a guy or gal who's, how much in shape is it? I hear a lot of talk for a lot of people, maybe it's not worth it to yeah. prone to injury. What, what do you think about that? You can thank Robert Orbers for that stupid shit. Yeah, exactly, shit. Yeah. exactly. Right. I mean, like I said, you know, I think it's difficult because although I am proud and I have a lot of respect for Orbers' accomplishments and, and strongman, where's your fucking degree? Yeah. And why are you telling I, people I like this? Oberst a lot, and in a weird way, because I'm so beat up, I kind of agree with him. Like, yeah. I, I don't deadlift with well, my, a bar my anymore. Question I is, do trap bar deadlifts. Let's go back to the beginning when you started. What if... I was standing there and told you when to stop and then made sure all, you were doing all the right accessory exercises in the beginning. Would it still be just as detrimental? See, that's the thing is the smarts allow extreme things to happen without the mileage. Yeah. Now, I agree with Oberst. If you're not going to go and research anything and you're not going to study how to train smart, you think you're just going to walk in the gym and deadlift, don't deadlift. But if you're a student of the game, there is ways to do it without getting hurt. So what I say to people... But most people do it without getting hurt. But someone that doesn't have yeah, access yeah. to someone of your caliber, what, what do they do? Well, so the first thing you would do is, that's why I created the YouTube channel. So Winning Strength has 350 videos, and a lot of them are set up for beginners. They're not set up for guys like me. Guys like me are 0.001% of the population. Guys like you are 65% of the population. So a lot of those videos, to me, when somebody tells me they don't know how to train because they're not looking hard enough, I mean, where did we figure out how to train? I was driving three hours away to learn how to fucking squat. Yeah. So it shows me what's the work ethic amount. I'm not saying you. No, know. I'm not. No, it's okay. But it's you, actually it's true, of, true of everything. There's people like Andy Galpin, who's a professor and gives out his entire information for free mm -hmm. in nutrition. Mm -hmm. And anybody can go there and get it. But, but who but, listens to it? Yeah, not a lot of people do. And so what you find people is the higher, become the, higher le the education and the less the entertainment the less popular it is and the average person doesn't find it. Right. So what you're, what most people are looking up, the average person, they're looking up stuff for entertainment value, not education value. And that's why it's still a lost I art. I was talking about this the other day and maybe this is something that we can have you look into. It's like, we need somebody like you on TikTok. Mm -hmm. We need somebody like you on Instagram reels. Like one minute. Yes. And, and it, I know it's hard to train somebody in like a minute, mm -hmm. but hopefully that minute could be like a flip up to a video yeah. that's longer. It, cre that it, creates, it. it creates the fishing pole to grab. Like I've done and little reels about like, um, maybe we can, we can even make one while we're here. But I've done little reels about like, here's what a speed squat is. Here's how to do it. Here's a, you know, the mm -hmm. speed box squat. Blah, sure. Blah, blah, right. And you can sort of pack all that information mm -hmm. in a minute. And hopefully somebody gets interested goes and watches the long. So if I were in your position right now, I think answering your question, yes, sir. I would start with work capacity before you start with strength. You need to be in shape first. Right. So people that are say extremely overweight, mm -hmm. the first thing that they need to do is just fucking move and start getting control of their diet. Mm -hmm. Once you get that down, then you can start working on the anaerobic capacities of strength training. But if you have that discipline first, the weight training discipline, in my opinion, is much easier. I can get my firemen to work out way harder than I get them to diet. So if you can control the diet, you can control everything. And that's really the separator between powerlifting and bodybuilding. The training is different, no question about it. The intensity is similar, just different rep ranges. The difference is the fucking diet in the 24-hour in the process versus powerlifters think that an hour and a half is all they need to get better. Whereas a bodybuilder understands that everything the whole day – is what makes you better plus the gym. And so for me, if I were in your shoes or in an average person's shoes that wants to lose weight and get better, start just by getting your 10,000 steps in, eating cleaner, trying to move after you eat and get control of your diet. And then once you have that down and you get some of that bad weight off, I think that when you're overweight, the hard part about deadlifting on you physically is the fact that your center of mass in the middle is so heavy mm -hmm. that when you lean over and pick up 405 it's like me and chris bell picking up 600 because we don't have the mass in the middle that we we're not our body weight's right. not also fighting us as well right but once you can get a little bit thinner and then this is where it really kicks in i think is important 
when you get thinner and you get a little bit more athletic just from dieting, your insulin response to food becomes better. And then when your insulin response is better, when you weight train, you gain more muscle quicker. So it, it's really a stepping stone coming back down to eating clean. And then what you notice too is a lot of people that are overweight or have issues, their sleeping patterns are fucking terrible. Right. We've been talking about that. A lot. We both have so, issues with it. A lot. Yeah. So I, that's what, and again, I want to tell you people. Have, you ever deal with sleep apnea? No. And that's, what's, that's why I think I was so successful is I don't snore. And I didn't snore at 300 pounds. Yeah. But I graduated high school at 250, 262, 265. So what I'm getting at is. It's a tank. You got to fix, you got to fix nutrition and sleep. Number one, you get those two dialed in and get them under control. Then you start the resistance training process. But I wouldn't start the the resistance training process with bilateral movements or heavy deadlifting or anything like that. I would do a lot of single leg stuff and I would do a lot of dumbbell kettlebell work and doing separating the left and right side. Maybe like leg press. Well, I would do more like a step up. Okay. So you would do a step up with like 15 pound dumbbells. The reason you don't want to do a leg press is because where's the stabilizers. Right. So if you're trying, now we're talking about progressing to deadlifting. Right. So if you want to be a good deadlifter, both left and right side need to be equal. Almost everyone walking around today that doesn't work out has a massive imbalance from left to right sides. If you fix those imbalances their before curb, their curb, their curb foot, the yeah. foot they use for the curb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I know that foot. It's my left one. Yeah, you're gonna always use that leg to step down. So if, yeah. if we were to go outside in the gym and do step ups, his curb foot would be twenty percent stronger than his non curb foot. Well, try go do a bilateral movement with that level of deficiency. You're gonna have a fucking back problem. So, and it's not stu- It's not like you don't go drive your car from Ohio to California with it out of alignment. Because by the time you get to California, your fucking tires are trashed. So, yeah. are you talking about eccentric strength? I'm just talking about unilateral strength, unilateral, unilateral strength. imbalances to be fixed before bilateral like your loading. Your step occurs. up doesn't need to be that hard. It can be a tiny step, uh, right. like, and you can work up to bigger steps. So, mm-hmm. but it needs like- to feel in general the left leg. Say your left leg's your mm-hmm. and on the left until right, and it feels. Same, ready, gotcha. or you're closer. Greg. That's incredible, incredible advice. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. get your weight under control, get your insulin under control, and when you weight train, you put on more muscle faster. Then correct lateral imbalances, then start bilateral loading, and now you got the five steps to death. Versus just saying, "Well, deadlifts aren't good for fucking anybody," and I wouldn't fucking do them. No, there's a process. Every exercise is good for you. Within reason, yeah. as long as the preparation to that exercise has been correct. Once you have skipped steps to make it to that exercise, you have a problem. And that's where I felt really bad when I saw Ober say that because I'm like, that would just dumb down and basically made everybody, well, I don't fucking deadlift because that's not good for you because I said that. Yeah. It's the process to get to the deadlift that was missing context. Right. <laughs> it does. Yeah. A lot. What about, um? so... Obviously, we have to talk about this because I'm the guy that made bigger, stronger, faster, <laughs> and you don't need to incriminate yourself at all. But like, at the I'm height, not afraid, of, I'm not afraid of jail, Chris. At the at the well, you're not gonna statute go to jail. of limitations, you're but fine. at the um, at the height <laughs> of West Side ago. Barbell, like what <laughs> what was the kind of amount of drugs people were taking in general, or is it like all over the board? Or what you I mean, find is this is what's really crazy. I think people don't really understand is that drugs for aesthetics are much more crazy than drugs for performance absolutely that's we, that's we a can great agree thing on that. to say yeah so bodybuilders use everything the most i've <laughs> ever saw anybody take at west side barbell was about a gram of test a week now i'll give you an example um i heard a handful of pro bodybuilders tell me that they take a gram of test per 100 pounds of body weight so that means a 300 pound man takes 3,000 milligrams a week of testosterone as a bodybuilder yeah, I Look, think Dallas that, McCarver was up in that And that's range. just the injections. That's not even including the insulin, growth hormone. See, insulin, growth hormone, IGF-1, all of those particular factors that would make you, in theory, look fucking jacked, does really nothing for performance within reason. Yeah, nothing really great. Not, real, maybe, not really maybe, anything uh, notable. Maybe help you a little bit with your recovery on yeah. with the HGH or yeah. whatever, but not... But not, not to the skill that you would think. So I find that aesthetic level drug use is much more insane and rampant than drugs for strength so again i told you what i reached and with power lifters they mainly take tests or they take in all sorts of shit well it depends on where the lineage comes from i mean louis wasn't a big proponent of using anything but 
testosterone and occasionally some D ball or an anavar or anadrol. Yeah. And anavars for the for some of the women. But the big thing is is what you find is that strength inducing performance. Anavar drugs. for the women. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, sitting yeah, over yeah, here. Yeah, well, yeah. I, I'm on yeah, Anavar. Yeah, yeah. I'm on Anavar. Yeah, but hold on a second. <laughs> if you look at the history of Anavar, Anavar was developed for female sprinters. Yeah. It was designed for no amortization, which is no bad side effects. It's the only basically bulletproof anabolic steroid that has no liver enzyme value changes, what we talked about. Yeah. So it's healthy for men, but it was originally designed for women. Get you the, hear that, ladies? Wow. <laughs> so get on the Anavar. So um, what you find is that most elite level powerlifters are probably going to be somewhere in the vicinity of a cc and a half to three or four cc's a week of testosterone. But remember what I said, I got to an 826, 572 and 722 squat bench deadlift drug free. And then when I went in to start working on testosterone, my testosterone level was 330, 350. So testosterone is not the only thing that makes you strong. How did I win collegiate national championships? And break all-time world records as a teenager. Yeah, I did a PR on my deadlift here in the gym, and then I got my testosterone levels checked like the next week. They were like two hundred. Yeah. And people are like, how did you do that? You're almost dead. And I'm like, I don't think it. I don't think it means everything. No, it doesn't. So basically, drugs, other than anadrol, with personal experience, drugs really just enhance the recovery process. But the problem is, is drugs most often times are utilized as a band-aid on a bullet hole for poor lifestyle decisions. So I never decided to take any anabolic steroids, so, and it was always an, never an issue for me, but my sleep was perfect, my diet was pretty good, and my stress levels were really low. And then I added anabolic steroids. Yeah, Mark did kind of the same thing. Yeah. He was like 28 or but something. But how many people do you know? Talking to your I, take, I take, you know, a couple, couple hundred milligrams of testosterone a week, but I only sleep two hours a day, and I have a really stressful job, and I got five kids by it's three no different good. girls. It's basically like just... Might as well not do anything. Yeah, exactly. You're just causing more damage than good. But if everything, if all the stars are aligned and whole health parameter, then you add that in, it's like putting nitrous on a fucking race motor. It's going to bump shit up. But again, everybody has their own experiences and opinions. But within the first year and a half to two years of drugs was the biggest bump I got, which was about 8 to 10%. And that's kind of all you'll ever get out eight of it. 8 to then, 10%. Then it'll just help you recover better after so that. 8 to 10%, which is, it wasn't like it doubled my strength. It got me to a 900 squat from an eight, right. which is really good. It's great. But here's right. the thing. And what I try to tell people is like that are thinking about doing that. Don't think take anabolic steroids. If you bench fucking 225, it only gives you 8%. That means you bench 250 and nobody still gives a fuck. Yeah. So why use the drugs when your body doesn't need them? It's kind of like, you're not going to put nitrous on your bone stock Honda Accord. It's not built for that. Yeah. But now you go take that engine and put $30,000 in it with horse pistons and a big cam and Billet crank. Now you can throw a 250 shot of nitrous on it. No big deal. Yeah. But nobody wants to. I've even found. That's a really great analogy with that. Yeah. I hope people slow. Help people rewind and listen to that again. Remember, I didn't touch drugs because of Eastern German research. I didn't touch drugs till I was almost 20. And I'd already been training for 15 years and then added it and yeah. I already had the big engine with the bull parts. And then I put the fuck. So all these young people, like, you know, kids I went to high school with on the football team that are just freaking in between their toes, you know, not yeah. a good idea, right? Absolutely not. You know, Mark, when he was younger, he got down to like probably like 10% body fat, got really lean, did all the diets, he did all the training. And then he did, like when he went to Westside, that's when Louis like, hey, you should get on some shit, you know, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. And so when Mark did it, he responded so well that he was in the WWE developmental at the time. And everybody would talk about how much steroids Mark Bell took because it worked for him. So all these other guys that were just jumping right on without ever, you know, like Mark had 10 Year, years of years, power. Yeah, lifting years of experience on his it. belt already. Again, Mark put nitrous on an already built motor, but people are putting nitrous on a motor that's not built for the power it makes now. Yeah. And that's when you start running into problems with skeletal muscular issues because muscle responds to drugs quickly. It doesn't necessarily enhance bone, ligament, and tendon. The soft tissues, right? The soft tissue issue. Yeah. It, it does over time, very, very, Minute dosages over many years, but when are they going to invent that stuff? What's the, uh, well keep your joints solid? Well, I mean now you have now you have the stem cell injections we just talked about yesterday, yeah. and I think that's going to be the next that big be thing. Part of it. Do you My, think those will ever be affordable for a common person? Aren't they astronomically I think expensive? We'll get there. Right They're now? about ten grand a joint right now, but the reason is because of how much. To get real stem cell injections that really work, 
you have to go to a different country because you get it out of the umbilical cord. My doctor was telling me that they can inject like billions of stem cells in you do it like also like systemic. Yeah. So that it like affects your whole body. Yeah. yeah. And he does it down in some other well, country. Well, this is Panama my theory on a thing. And don't get me wrong. I am not the expert on this, but I've done a little bit of reading and research and talked to Serrano and a handful of other doctors. You know, when you're young, like real young, like under 15 and you get hurt and how fast you heal because of how many around. Right. The cells understand and respond to recovery fast. As you age, the cell loses its capacity. It's kind of like if we all sit down and got a hundred books in this room and we read them and we just stay and read them and read them and read them until we understand all those books. And then you don't see those books for 50 years. How much of that pain? Mm -hmm. Cell knowledge is very similar. As you age, it forgets how to re. re and when you hurt something, have the knowledge anymore to repair itself. So we're, if we were asked about those books the next day, we'd remember a lot of exactly. It. So just the, like the exactly. Cells, so yeah. the stem cells, in my opinion, are very similar cellularly. They reprogram the 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 cell itself in the area to understand regeneration and fix itself. And so I think that's going to be the next big thing. And I think it will come down, but they're going to keep it high because once they start figuring out how well it works. And now those knee and hip doctors don't charge fifty six grand to redo a, a, a replacement. Now you can just get an injection. What are they going to do? See, and that's where they're going to be expensive because, in theory, my opinion is the reason it's not as readily available to the average person in America right now because the doctors don't want it readily available. It's going to hurt an industry. Yeah, it's kind of like, what do you think the gas guys are doing right now that they know everything's going to switch to electric? They're fucking flipping ass. Yeah. Because now, oh, I'm going to lose that $7 a gallon out in California. You guys are paying for fucking gas. What's going to happen then? You see what I mean? They gotta find so, way. again, that's my thought process of what's happening with doctors. If they figure out a self-regeneration drug that you don't need Is as many surgeries over? anymore, <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, right? So awesome. Maybe they should all go into stem cells, right? Like the, the doctors well, that, that would replacing be, knees, going to a different, different So you area. have to fly to Columbia. Because, and then right now, the religion type stuff is... Because they feel what stops it from harvesting other embryos or people that aren't real matrix kind of shit. Yeah. Just to take the stem cell. It's been very weird for years. And it's weird that we hold up our health due to like religious things. I, I always thought yeah. that was really weird. Well, I mean, you know, it's one of those things. I, it, and that's what's so weird about politics is like, you notice the Democrats and Republicans, you would think the stuff that they believe religious wise would match, but, but it if doesn't. you think if we have stuff that could completely get people out of pain yeah. or like just end suffering in general, like people yeah. with these crazy injuries, it's like, imagine if we could do that. And it's like, well, we, we kind of can, but our government doesn't allow it. It's yeah. so crazy to me. Yeah. I think the hardest part is right now we have the Democrats and Republicans so divided in so many areas that it's causing the advancement, of all kinds of areas kind of negated. To shut down. Cause like, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, one place. You think all the Republicans with how much they want the economy to do better and all that, that they wouldn't be, have such a stance on abortion or stem cell. But Republican people are oftentimes very religious, but then the Democrat people are oftentimes not, but then they have all these weird regulations that they want to help everyone, when well, in reality like the this economy whole, can't sustain that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting because it's like this whole idea of uh, lab-grown meat still has to come from an aborted cow fetus. Right. So people are trying to like figure the way around, like how do we get around that? It's like, well, you really can't. That's how yeah. you make... Or the environmentalists think this is great because now you don't have to have a cow getting and putting out methane, having to slaughter them. I mean, think about how much grass, oxygen, and everything else it takes to run one cattle. Yeah. And think about how much we eat of that. Well, if they could do it synthetically, now you don't have any of that waste product. Yeah. But what people don't realize, we, don't, we also don't have an ecosystem. We get rid of those things. Sure. Like those things are, are for a reason. You know, the, yeah. cow, the cow eats the grass. It yeah. poops on the grass. It fertilizes the well, place where they can grow crops next year. The hardest part with all of it, though, is in reality, I think we all, you know, and this gets way off topic of training, but my opinion is the reason we're having so many problems now with the world and the way we're having global things is basically the fact that we're just overpopulated the world. I mean, in reality, if the population was half, we wouldn't have a gas problem. We wouldn't have a pollution problem. But we just keep reproducing. And it's, it's, not, it's not America. If you look at India and China, take those two countries and just, in theory, wipe them out. Just fix probably fifty percent of the pollution in the entire world. Oh yeah, India is the worst. So I remember reading a study that thirty percent of California's pollution is Chinese, coming from over the seas. Oh wow! 
So California is trying to say we need all. You mean like plastic material being no, no, shipped no, like over in the air? No, in the air. air. In the air. So remember, they have no EPA. Wow. They have no. They have no control. And effects. India, the air quality is so bad that you can't even go outside some days. Yeah. Because I have people that are fans in India. Yeah. And they'll send me. Things and I'm like pretty that. sure I'm like, that their what? population has crossed or is close to crossing over to be bigger than China, which we're talking billions of right. people. Mm-hmm. We're only what 400 million in America, yeah. and we're worried about going to electric. Like we need to have world sanctions on these countries to suppress the amount of people that they're having. That's what's causing the pollution. They and got the no limits. Rise of temperature, and they don't have no control over diesel engines running wide open, and pollution everywhere. I mean, you go to like you know a, a, a large city and see all the two-stroke mopeds just putting out oil fumes. They have no EPA. Yeah, and I think, and we're worried about our shit. It right. is interesting because we're overpopulated, but we also we also still have a lot of room on this planet. You know, yeah. it's just that everybody's concentrated in these areas because mm-hmm. yeah. that's where they need to stay to live because well, that's where the cities are and whatever. So, and your, our part is is like if you look at where the prime places to live that have the best weather and the best resources, those areas are where very they're, crowded. They're in demand. It's the areas we're talking about. Yeah, there's a lot of room in the world, but actually live in it's almost it's, uninhabitable. Antarctica is uninhabitable. Well, I'd say half of Russia is uninhabitable. Yeah. You know, the entire North Pole, I would say three, four hundred miles above the above the U.S. border in right. Canada is pretty much uninhabitable, mm-hmm. at least most of the year. Yeah. So, again, how much of that earth is really able to be used? Yeah. And then you don't want to just start chopping down all the jungles in South America. Yeah. And it's, and it's not the population. It's what the population uses that's becoming the problem. So you think about the houses that we build, how much lumber it takes all these materials, where do they come from? And how do you regenerate them? Eventually it's going to run out. Yeah. And so it's interesting, all that stuff, but let me ask you a little bit about, um, before we get going here about nutrition. Um, what, what have you seen? You know, you've been around for a long time. Um, you were, you've been through the fat power lifter stage, (laughs) right? Um, first of all, is it important for power lifters to, to have some chub? And second of all, what do you do for a diet and what do you recommend? Well, I truly believe that once you get below 12, 14%, which is still pretty lean for the average person, you get below 12, 14%, you're going to start hampering overall performance. I mean, even if you watch videos of when Stan Efforting, let's use Stan Efforting as an example. When he was at his strongest, he wasn't his leanest. I'm not saying he wasn't lean, yeah, he's but still he wasn't lean, IFBB not, pro bodybuilder. Exactly. And the thing of it is, is if you were really strong, stepping on stage or the strongest guys in the world, why is it no pro bodybuilders ever won a world's strongest man? Or has any all-time world records in powerlifting other than Stan? Because they're starving. Because they're, they're fucking <laughs> have no energy. There's yeah. no power. Too lean, too powerful. So I do believe that there is a tipping point, and some of that's genetic. Some people, like Larry Wheels, could probably be around 10% and still be, be super strong. strong. Yeah. But then you got guys like Shane Hammond back in the day that he had to weigh that. So certain amounts of size create leverages, center of mass qualities that are adva- advantageous for one rep maxes. I mean, look at Vasily Alexiev in his past his prime. He looked like a humongous fat dude. It was a professional eater, but he had the world record in the clean and jerk and the snatch. And he for, had like the ultimate uh, outfit that would show yeah. off his gut. Yeah. Like it, it was like this, uh, hey man, and you see his nipples and his gut. Yeah, it, it was, was the, terrible. Thinnest, the thinnest singlet you've ever seen. <laughs> Pull him up, Vasily Alexiev. Vas- Alexiev, yeah. And you can see pictures of him when he was younger and pretty, pretty ripped. He's got an amazing singlet. Then as he got bigger. But the point is, is with... Guys like him and stuff, um, you know, catching snatches and catching cleans, center of mass in the middle helps a lot with balance and coordination and stability. That guy did what, like 600 over his head? Uh, I think it was 578. 578. I'm giving a little more credit. 600, well, <laughs> six, nobody had broke the 600 barrier, but that one guy from— Somebody did, though, right? Um, I think they are close. Uh, that one dude from Georgia, that the country, Georgia, yeah. he, he's got the all-time record in the clean and jerk snatch total now. But uh-huh. Alexia, yeah, there you found it. Kind of see that single, it's amazing. So there's your there's the only strength athlete that has ever been on the front cover of Sports Illustrated as athlete of the year. So he had close to a hundred world records in Olympic lifting. Think about that. He That's was amazing. There it is, Sports Illustrated. Yep. And so he's got the your, singlet on him, Sports yep. Illustrated. So in 1975, he was the world's greatest athlete by Sports Illustrated. That'll never happen again with powerlifting or Olympic lifting, in my opinion. So that shows you how badass he really was. Going back to uh, nutrition, what kind of nutrition do you follow? 
Well, so I'm vertical. You know, I, I learned it from Stan quite Stan a few years ago. Um, I looked at him and go, dude, well, you can be leaner and be stronger. He was my first drive because when Stan was at his strongest, I was coming out of gear or going raw. And I was like, well, I want to be like Stan, you know. Um, and so that was their approach. Um, what was your diet before that? Just whatever you wanted? Well, or? when I was weighing over 300, I just kind of had to exhaust anything that sounded good because I didn't want to eat anymore. My natural body weight, it likes to be probably about 250. So for me to weigh 310, 315, 65 plus more pounds, I kind of had just had to eat whatever sounded good and, and, and gorge it. Yeah. So then by the time I was ready to eat cleaner, I was so tired of eating like that and feeling like shit just to be strong one rep max. It was really easy for me to go clean my diet because I had so much muscle mass that my resting metabolic weight was really high. And as soon as I cleaned it up, I would say within eight months, I was down in the 270s, but I was already lost six or eight inches. A lot of that was just inflammation. You don't lose body fat that quick, in my opinion. But I just try to do everything diet-wise that's low inflammatory. So I keep away from processed dairy. I keep away from gluten um, as much as I can. Sometimes I'll have a cheat meal every once By in a while. By processed dairy, what do you mean? Um, no milk. Uh, no regular yogurt. I'll do Greek yogurt um, for the higher protein. Obviously, the one that tastes like shit and doesn't have any carbs in it. And I'll do a little bit of hard cheeses. But I don't do any mozzarella um, I don't do any kind of any kind of processed dairy. Same thing holds true with gluten. I don't eat any bread, um, and that really fixed a lot of the problems. And then after a while, I was curious, so I went to Serrano and had a food allergy test. Oh, it! I'm allergic to fucking dairy and gluten. Mm. So the shit that I cut out, my body was holding 50 pounds of inflammation. Boom, gone. Yeah. So I say to anybody listening, go get a food allergy test and see what you're eating all the time. That your body doesn't like and creating a defense mechanism too. First step is take that shit out because your body doesn't like it. How so, hard or easy was it to get a food allergy test? Really easy. I think it was like, I want to say it was a hundred bucks and it took like a week and a half to get the results back. So what they do is they bring in, and the one I did, they had you eat a food and then they like testing on your blood in like 20, 30 minutes and seeing what this one did and that one did. And then so mine is even some vegetables that you are good for you. Some people it's not good for them. Because it creates an inflammatory yeah, effect. Yeah, that's why the carnivore diet is very effective because, like, you don't really yeah. know which one it is, and but so, you just kind of cut them all so off. So, we kind of do what we call carnivore diet. I still eat some more vegetables, but we do uh, the vertical diet, in my opinion, is carnivore ish because I'm eating close to three pounds of meat a day. But what it is, it's timed carbs. So, I put my rice around my training. So I'll eat a cup an hour before I work out. Then I drink pentacarb from ATP, which is basically ground up flavored rice while I'm training, and then I go eat a cup of rice when I'm done working out, roughly, and that gives me all the energy I need and replenishes my muscle glycogen, but then the rest of the day is more keto style. So it's kind of a hybrid, yeah. a conjugate style yeah, yeah. of doing... It's so carnivore. interesting because I, I do a lot of the same things, and I'm able to like really manipulate and change my diet every, every day, almost, because, because we've learned everything. Mm -hmm. So I think that like when you have a palate of like... You know, we've learned vertical, we've learned, learned carnivore, we've learned keto. We learn why certain yep. things work and why certain things don't. So it's like, it's fun. Like sometimes I'll go, you know what? I just feel like throwing in some rice. So I'll, yeah. I'll throw it in. And probably the same as you, like around a workout. Usually mm -hmm. like, you know, for me, usually after a workout. Yeah. Just to replenish and just to have something good to eat. Well, I think the thing of it is, is everybody's on a different path. Everybody to be healthy or strong is probably going to have to figure out what best works for them. Stan Efferding's diet is very close to how Flex Wheeler ate when he was in his prime. Um, but I'm sure that there's 20 other bodybuilders that's done it 20 other different ways and achieved similar results. So it doesn't mean that everything works. But the problem is, is does it work for you right now? And is it lined up with how your genetics are and your past? So, you know, the vertical diet works really well for me because I don't do well on low carb. But it's because most of my training still revolves around power and explosiveness. And when you do that low carb... It's not real easy to do, as you will know. So for me, if I was just training for aesthetics, I'd cut the rice out because what does it matter if you feel like shit if you're doing bicep curls with 40s? Yeah. But it matters when you got 800 on your back because that shit will break you. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's that balance between still holding on to as much strength as I can but doing it in a healthy fashion where I'm not overeating poor selective foods. Sure. I think um, 
Now, I've done carnivore for long periods of time and stayed relatively strong, but I also wasn't breaking any world records. I wasn't. So I, I always recommend to everybody, which is a, usually a surprise to people, is if they're in powerlifting and they're in decent shape, I'm mm -hmm. like, do the vertical diet. Absolutely. I tell everybody because well, like I think I said, that that's perfect for powerlifting. And I don't yeah. necessarily think, want to give, give somebody the wrong information based on my own preference. Sure. Yeah. And that's hard to do because you, you only really have the experience what you have done for yourself. I mean, I have experience with hundreds of firemen and, and lots, thousands of military guys, but at the end of the day, they all had their own limitations. So reality, what really works is something that might take 10 or 20 years to figure out, and that's not normal for most people. And so a lot of it just comes back down to trial and error, and it takes time. You know, somebody doesn't get overweight and out of shape in six months. Mm. It's years. And somebody doesn't learn how to work out or eat clean for years. So it's kind of like the mountain, you know, and you, snowball rolls down one way. You got to push that snowball back up to the top and roll it back down the other way. Mm. But people think they can just jump across the other side of the mountain and go, well, I'm, I'm fat and I feel like shit, but in six weeks, I'm going to be fucking jacked and strong. You know, I mean, yeah. unless you're some freakazoid, it's not going to work that way. So my point is, is experiment, try the stuff I'm telling you, do the stuff you're doing and just, and just play around with it. And so you can make match your lifestyle and if you're making progress, whether it's fast or slow, I would prefer slow because slow usually lasts. Then keep path. You know, something usually is going to tell you if it's right or I wrong. I also think if people are out there listening to this and they're they are a power lifter, but they want to drop down to the next weight class. I mean, the way that I originally stayed strong and dropped to a lower weight class was a carnivore diet, and mm -hmm. I think that people can stay really strong yeah. just eating red meat. But you have to eat enough red meat. And you also have to be really strict. If you're going to do that, you got to be really strict. So as an intervention for some, it may be a great way to get down to another yeah. weight class and stay strong because otherwise they're going to be starving themselves trying to get down to a weight class and not have any food in them. What's nice about carnivore is you're getting all the minerals and nutrients of red meat and you're getting some protein and fat in, Absolutely. and then you're just moving along. I say the big issue you have to find and be careful with is when you start cutting out carbs that far, not the carbs that are the problem and reason it's the lack of sodium so mm -hmm. remember when you eat high carb usually high sodium when you start cutting back the carbs sodium has to stay you have to salt your more the yep. cleaner you eat the more salt you need exactly. which is not common people will hear about any yeah but i think there's a book called the salt fix or something yeah, like that dr james nicola antonio is that what yep. it's called the salt fix mm -hmm. but yeah read that book because it'll blow your fucking mind yeah i think also just like adding in things like uh, electrolytes like we use um, mark has his own hydration packs we used mm -hmm. used to be sponsored by element like any of those kind of liquid iv um yep. you know uh sugar could be a good thing but if you're fighting your weight don't get like liquid iv has sugar and there's a reason why because it helps retain the sodium yep. Um, but if you're fighting your weight, I don't think people should throw the sugar in. But No, that would be more. I would say those things would be better off for contest day when you've already weighed in or if you're doing endurance sports where you've really depleted a lot of shit. Yeah, but most of the electrolyte packets like Element or Mark's Hydration yeah. Packs have no carbs in them and they're, That's they're low in sugar and they're perfect. And potassium there. is the other big one that you start having to really balance when your diet is clean or your body fat percentage gets low. That can be another issue too. You have to kind of watch those areas. And like I said, just go to your – Doctor, tell him what your plans are and what you want to do. Let him do blood work and fix the bullet holes instead of just putting Band-Aids on shit. Because you might be I running around with a shitty testosterone level. You might be running around with an insulin problem. And now you're compounding it by doing other things that are not going to help those areas in the first place. I, I think blood work is really vitally important, especially as much as we talk to Stan Efforting. Mark and I go through um, Merrick Health um, to get our blood work done. But... People can just go, they can go anywhere, literally mm -hmm. just walk to your, go to your doctor and ask for it. The, uh, the problem is that it's very, it's actually very expensive to just do blood work on your own. Mm -hmm. Like you go through those, those private MD labs and it's still costing you 400 bucks. So I say you might as well go to something like Merrick health for 400 bucks. They'll do your blood work, but they also read it for you. And then they prescribe yeah, you whatever you need, which is awesome, which is great. And so you definitely want to hook up into one of those particular positions. And the reason that it's cost so much to do it by regular doctor because that's not what they do all the time so again it'd be like work on chevrolets and i bring you a mercedes you're going to charge me more because you don't know shit about that car yeah and i'm not saying doctors don't know about blood work but you'd be surprised the average doctor that doesn't study that all the time is not going to have the same information 
is somebody that that's all that they do, like a Serrano, for example. What's interesting is that insurance won't pay for a full panel. But if you think about it, right, the, here's where the insurance companies are missing out. They could be saving a ton on the back end. Well, if you do a full panel for people that you can save a ton on the back end by knowing their health outcomes, you also do more, prescribe more shit because mm -hmm. you can see more problems. Well, so not it's only like that, you're also <laughs> saving from anything getting extreme that could have been by not doing a full and panel. And it could save them a lot of, a lot of money in paying for your cancer care or something. So if for they example, catch we have a huge testosterone issue, which I feel is caused by environmental and plastics. If you look at, like, I really think cancer is environmental. It makes so much sense that it's yeah. more environmental. Well, I think anything. it wasn't as big of a. It, we didn't know how bad cancer was, and I'm just being theoretical. Fifteen hundred years ago, because nobody fucking lived that long. But now that we live longer, we're starting to see the cell damage from consistent abuse, either from diet, environmental issues, cleaners. You know, the big thing that we do is we clean with everything natural. We don't use anything that has any harsh chemicals in it. Um, you got to be really careful with a lot of stuff like sodium benzene. And, it, and it's hard to stay away though, because then you walk into like a public restroom and they just, you yeah. know, So think about the domino Clorox. effects. You're going to control <laughs> the areas that you control. So the first thing I did when I went into the fire departments is I threw away all their plastic cups. They got to drink out of ceramic or because I knew their testosterone. You're a big believer in this. Huge, huge. And I got all that from Paula Quinn. Um, you know, what's funny is if you go overseas, there are quite a few countries that don't even allow certain products with their population because they know it's harmful. And for some reason in America, the big companies run everything and they don't give a fuck. Well, for example, hard. aluminum and deodorant is known in European, European countries to cause fucking cancer, lymph, food, lymph node and breast cancer. Right. And we don't fucking ban it. But so what was weird is when you start traveling internationally and you go to the grocery store, start seeing the shit that they don't have. And then you start doing some research and they figured out as a country, these wow. things are terrible. Wow. And we sell them all the fucking time over here. What's interesting to me is like, you can't even buy meat without plastic on it. No. And I do a carnivore diet. It's, it's all, yeah. you know, packed in the plastic. And I'm, is that detrimental? I'm like, I'm wondering, yeah. I'm sure it's not great. It's I don't know great. how much styrofoam, styrofoam is another big thing we utilize for the last 50 years. And it's fucking terrible. Um, there's a lot of different things. And again, one dose is not terrible, but think about how many times you're around that shit in 50 years. You just try to limit things. Now we got a problem. So pull some of those dominoes out of your life. If I were to say the biggest dominoes to pull away, try to stay away from plastics as much as possible. Try to stay away from anything that has sodium benzenate in it, which is a preservative, but benzene is one of the most toxic things you can have what in your body. What things have sodium benzenate in them? Uh, well, like the energy drink that I was drinking instead of water. Um, a lot of things that are preservatives. A lot of pop has sodium benzenate in it. Huh. Um, stay away from and that. And what does that do? Uh, it's basically one of the highest causes of cancers, and it has a lot of fucking problems. So these energy drinks that I've drank here, that I've drank here in the last two days, only ones I've had in five years. They're, they're once they're in your atmosphere, those drinks are hard to. So you know what's what's interesting as like an issue here, we can get all the monster we want for free, mm -hmm. and um, Mark has this company, Liquid Death. I think he had yeah. one yesterday. I'm trying to get them. Like I'd rather have our fridges packed with that. But it, but they're just not a sponsor yet. Sure. So I'm actually trying to make that change because yeah. I'm like, man, if I'm here and we have tons of free energy drinks, yeah. what are you going to do? You're going to drink I'm not them. talking to the person that has an energy drink once a week to get through training. I'm talking about the, we know these people. I'm talking about the people that drink four or five of those. Five. Yeah. I, th I think they're too uh, good to not start drinking. A lot two, of times three, I'll drink like one a day, but since we have unlimited, mm -hmm. I don't even want to drink one. Right. But I'm like, well, it's here. Might as well have it. Might as well have it. So yeah. I, would stay away from, I would stay away from sodium benzenate. I try to stay away from as much aluminum as we can. And most of the things that have sodium benzenate are also packaged in aluminum because they, they say, I know there's a couple of doctors I'd have to look up the papers that 70% of Alzheimer's and dementia in later stages is caused from aluminum toxicity in the brain. Jeez. Think about how much shit we're And that's all in aluminum. our deodorant too, right? And we rub right, it so in our armpits. I don't use armpits. any aluminum deodorant. Wow. I don't drink hardly anything out of cans. I don't use any of the aluminum deodorant anymore. Once I no. found that out, I'm like, Now I'll oh. give you, I'll give you a hint. The best one that you can use is native. You can get it at Target and probably oh, yeah, other yeah. places. I've used Native before. But Native has none of that shit in it. Okay. And it's solid and it works forever. So like, you know, Tom's, you put it on in three hours, you smell like There's a another one that I use called Every Man, Man Jack. And, and that one's pretty good, good too. but it gives me rashes for some reason oh, and my it? body doesn't like it as much. Try Native if you need something that works really well good, or though. you're a sweater. It's it expensive. really good. Um, watch that. You want to watch anything with parabens and sulfates, which America's catching on. If you go and buy, say, next time you go buy body wash, 
start looking around and see all the things that say big print. Yeah. So a lot of the bigger a lot of the bigger companies free. paraben free. Where the fuck a lot of the that bigger companies from? like even like Irish Spring I've seen that paraben free. They have to because here's the thing is overseas there's certain they countries they don't even allow it because wow. they know it's fucking bad. But you know, over here we've let these chemicals companies push all this shit on us. And so I would stay away the from The other thing that's interesting is we have a lot of people that will will fight for that stuff you know oh, like yeah. like oh there's nothing wrong with it like just you know like you'll have a lot of people on the, on youtube or instagram but they don't realize that the studies that they're quoting from are like funded by the companies and, that are making that and stuff they're short term show me a 20-year study that's what i want to see yeah because remember we just talked about it. it's a domino it's not the factor pull it away keep the other dominoes from hitting the other ones well, it's, so, it, it, it's like a high amount of steroids over the course of one year probably won't kill anybody. But show me the 20-year study and like, yeah, there's a lot of damage going on. Huge because, damage. And, you know, that's you know. the big issue with the whole situation. And, you know, they were even, you know, when Lyle Alzado died of that brain tumor, they pushed it on anabolic steroids. And then he came back and lied and said, no, this was from something else. That thing Remember was that? really interesting because a lot of people don't know this, but the only re so Lyle Alzado got a brain tumor. That has only been associated with AIDS patients. Mm -hmm. And Lyle Alzado was known to cruise Santa Monica Boulevard in Los Angeles and Hollywood mm -hmm. on Saturday nights looking for young boys. Mm -hmm. So those facts together and all the things I hear from Gold's Gym about Lyle Alzado point to that he died from AIDS mm -hmm. rather than, but there's no proof and nobody no. can prove it. Possibly. Possibly. Yeah. So that's here, what I'm saying. That's what the evidence yeah. points to. So here's the thing. But there's no proof. We, yeah. You know, and some of our government and society has pushed that on, you know, the anabolic steroids, and I'm not pro or against if you are not about them, I understand your, your concern, but it's the only drug in 1987 that was banned and treated like a class A f felony that never had any scientific background that it was harmful for you at all. And don't you find it ironic 35 years later, any anti-aging clinic all across the world is using testosterone to fix anti-aging problems. When 20 years ago, you'd have been a fucking asshole for using drugs. The biggest con in the world is uh, Dr. Robert Goldman. Everybody always talks about him being this great guy who has like, he's got a museum. To, you know, every year he puts, he put Ed Cohen in the museum and Ed Cohen's like, hey, I'm getting inducted. I go, yeah, that guy's a scam artist. And he's like, what are you talking about? I go, well, he wrote Death in the Locker Room. He's the guy that put out that you can get liver cancer from steroids, that they cause liver cancer. He's the guy that put out that all so these people Eddie, are so dying. Did, so did Eddie let him put him in his Hall of Fame? Oh, he's still, well, yeah, no. Oh, that makes sense. Well, Ed's, Ed's the man. Well, <laughs> yeah, but, but, but I'm saying like that, what I'm saying is that that, um, that guy who wrote Death in the Locker Room also now owns the A4M, which is the anti-aging uh, federation. Like, so basically, he told everybody steroids are going to kill oh, you wow. in the 1980s. And now he's And pro. then by 1990, he was selling HGH and testosterone to the world. Mm -hmm. And he has like steroid island. Like we were making fun of it because like, when I did Bigger, Stronger, Faster, I spent a lot of time with this guy. And he is a weirdo. I mean, when you go to his place, he's got a Hall of Fame to himself. Like yeah. about himself. He's got the record in like one arm push ups. He's got all these records that don't mean shit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and and he brags about them. But he's the guy that put a stain on steroids yeah. forever. Wow. From day one, he's a big reason why they were and, and now he's out making millions of dollars off of people well, using them. It shows it shows you that there are lots of people that gravitate towards whatever's popular at that time. And if he'd have stayed on that anti anti steroid kick, now he'd be shunned again. So they just follow the wave yeah. where the money goes. And that, that can be a big issue. You know, and that, that's something that I've never done because for me, I got into lifting because it was a passion of mine. It would be hard for me to get away from it in any aspect because it's my lifestyle. You start finding that other people, maybe health is that guy's lifestyle, but he'll ride whatever fucking wave is going to make him money. Yeah, what's interesting is that um, it, it's just so fascinating that like no one ever like brings it up to him. You know, and if you bring it up to him, it's like, oh, that's what we thought at the time. And then we found out there are, you know, he blames it on the research at hand. Yeah. 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 And when there was no research at hand, when he wrote none. that, he just sort of made it up. There was none. You know, I mean, think about it. Like, it, yeah, it was the whole the Russians are better than us at anaerobic sports because of anabolic steroids, which was completely wrong. They had hundreds and thousands of researchers that were studying anaerobic sports and we had fucking zero. Yeah. 
You know what I mean? Other than a handful of small. One of the pockets. most interesting things I love, I actually have always wanted to like make a documentary about this is uh, the Dynamo Swim Club from Germany, mm-hmm. which was like all these women and they yeah, were the like Germans. crazily juiced up, and they had all these children with crazy birth defects and all mm-hmm. that. Like I've never really seen anything in depth on it, but it's yeah, they kind of just pushed it under the rug. Yeah, and it's stayed pretty quiet about incredible. It. If you, know? you really want to, st- I mean, I don't know all about that, but doing my research for the book I'm going to write for Human Kinetics on conjugate training. Um, I started digging and digging and digging, and what I found was I almost wish that East Germany would have stayed the way it was for just a little bit longer because, see, the Russians' problem was they had all these scientists and they had all this research on how to get better, but their economy wasn't. They didn't have the money to sometimes have the training halls or the food that they needed. Bulgaria was in the same problem. They had great training coaches and methodologies on how to work out, but the people lived like shit. Well, East Germany was the topper echelon of the Eastern Bloc countries because once they became good at sports, they had all the Soviet coaches helping them design the programs. They had learned from the Soviet and Bulgarians' mistakes, but the East Germans had money. And so their training halls were better. The athletes were treated better. They were eating better, housed better, blah, 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 blah. But it didn't last long enough for everybody to see what happens when you mix the East and the West. So the advantages to the East, i.e. America, the Western world, or I'm sorry, the advantages to the West was that we had endless amounts of money and the athletes got treated really well. The advantages to the West or the East, the Russian blocks, they had all the science, they had all the research, and they had all of the understanding on how to train, but they didn't have the economic function in order to see what happened. East Germany had both, and but it wasn't long enough to well, see what was happening. It's crazy when we made Bigger, Stronger, Faster and talking to some of these old school guys that were around in 1957 when they found out, oh, the Russians are doping, and then they started doping, right? And it started out with uh, five milligram D balls, and everybody was taking it and doing great. But then, really, really fast, they found out where to get more of it. And the the guys that were like lifting the crazy weights, yeah, they're like, man, I can't believe you're doing this all, all on five milligrams. Like, oh no, I'm on fifty. You want to know how the Russians found out about the anabolic steroids? Oh, the Russians found out it from the Nazis. So Nazis were the first ones to make anabolics in the late '30s. They were experimenting with the one with Jewish prisoners. And it was a water-based injection. Well, they were also like giving it to the uh, SS soldiers. Yeah, and the reason increasing. The, the reason was to increase fertility. They thought. Well, and and they thought that it would make them more aggressive in fighting. Yeah, and it did. So if you look at how they were doing a lot of that studying in East Germany, right? That's where all the concentration camps were. That's where all the scientists were. So when World War II came and happened, and then Germany got split, what country took over the East? Russia. So they ran into all the research and development on all the athletic shit, huh. steroids and everything. So by, I'd say, 39, 40, up to about 1950, that's the Soviets found all of their research on all of that shit and just progressed it. Amazing. And so that's where they developed D-Ball and all these other different connector drugs to the, the original anabolic steroids that the Nazis were developing for not only soldiers, but experimenting on prisoners. So before we get out of here, explain to me, you have a great YouTube channel. Yeah. I watched a couple of your videos. Uh, you talk in depth about, you know, how athletes should move and train and work out. Can you tell us a little bit about your channel, where people can find it and where they can find you? Yeah. So go to Winning Strength, uh, pretty simple, W-E-N-N-I-N-G. Um, we got, I think, 350 videos on training methodology, programming, technique work, recovery, GPP, some nutrition stuff. And then if you go to winningstrength.com, we have very detailed manuals of each type of training block, power building, hypertrophy. And people can buy these manuals. Yeah, off-season, um, all of these different things. And we also sell all the equipment that you guys have, um, plus some other pieces. And uh, then we do, all, we do ultimate online coaching. So almost all the on, – actually, all of the online coaches that I have on my page all have master's degrees or former high-level colleges or pro teams which they just wanted to retire or do something on the side. And I said, well, come work for me and I'll, you can online coach. Cause I mean, where can you get somebody that's coached or in the college level? Like I, one of the guys is from, was from Kansas. Another guy is uh, Carl Lewis's side dude yeah. down South with the track teams. And you can purchase online coaching from these exact people, not some shithead that's just selling you something. That's great. So all the questions you will know when we get These on are the like site. People handpicked by you. Yeah, handpicked by me over twenty years. So actually, one of the guys that's an online coach, Wade, 
he was my old boss at Ball State and played for the Dolphins and the Bengals and has a master's degree, and he's a master CSCC. You know how many people in the MAC have a master CSCC? That's like the highest level of the NSCA certification. That would mean Boyd Epley, Mad Dog, Jeff Madden, and those guys certified him to be an elite strength coach. One last thing I wanted to ask you is like what uh, mistakes are people making today in their training? I have a lot of people that um, come into our gym and they'll do things that I just – I just never did, so I don't know if they're right or wrong. Like uh, a lot of people that do a lot of squatting and deadlifting on the same day, which I just never, never done that. Um, Mark like and I this. don't really agree with it. But like, what yeah. what are some things that people are doing that are wrong, and what what should they be fixing? Well, let's go. Okay, let's split it into two separations. His st- his particular demographic and our demographic. In his demographic, they are too focused on the workouts before they're focused on fixing everything else in their life to make workouts actually function that'd be a big issue the first thing i would fix with somebody that needs to lose weight is fix their sleep um i could even show you a paper that shows how much body fat you lose sleeps right versus wrong with the same training so there's your fucking problem there your the focus is thinking that the gym fixes everything and it's wrong it fixes a lot but there are certain areas that just have to be in place first on your side of the ball impatience is the killer of everything you know, I remember this clean as day, and I just talked about this on Bell's, po- on Bell's podcast. Um, Ed Cohen saw me squat 700 at 21 years old. He told me at that meet, he goes, man, if you can stay healthy in another five or eight years, you'll squat 800. And you're thinking, I'm going to do that in two weeks. Well, I'm thinking, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, what I'm thinking is, at first, I'm a little upset because I'm thinking, man, take me that long, another 100 pounds. That's what I'm saying. But then again, I'm like, well, fuck it. I, I like to train anyway. See, that's the right attitude. Like to work out, don't like the goal. The goal comes if you like working out. And so lose weight. Don't focus on weighing yourself every day. Focus on the process and then weigh yourself in six months and see what the fuck happens. Because like everything else, weight loss and strength training works in waves. It doesn't work linear. So you don't lose a pound a day. You might lose two pounds one week and gain a pound back the next, then lose two or three pounds the next week, then back a pound and a half. Just keeps going down. But now over the course of 10 years, it would look like a straight line. But if you break it down and zoom in to each training session or week, it, it's waving. And so strength training is the same way. You don't get strong linear. You get strong in waves. So like to work out, try to break records and PRs, but don't get upset when it's not going 100% or you don't make the progress that you're supposed to. Progress happens for a handful of reasons. One, genetics allow it. Two, your training's smart enough. And three, are you recovering enough to actually let the training even do its job? So it's kind of like, you know, I look at it in this perspective. Let's say you're a billionaire, but you work 80 hours a week. You never go outside. You never go anywhere. How the fuck do you even spend that? You don't. It just sits there and accumulates and accumulates. And that's kind of the problem with training is that you might think you're putting all this effort and energy into working out, but if you're not stepping outside and letting the body recover, to show what you've accumulated, it's never going to grow. You're never going to really experience what you develop because you're constantly in the hole. That makes sense what I'm saying? Yeah. So you have to step back and understanding that recovery is maybe more important than training itself. If you can't recover, you can't do it over why, time. Why are so many people fixated on deadlifting and squatting pretty heavy in the same day? It seems to me like it doesn't make much sense. I never was a huge proponent of that, ever. Um, to me, it might be for a different reason. It's compressive factors. So if I just smashed my back with a back squat, and now I just smashed my back with a deadlift, how do you regenerate the discs over time to accommodate that? The answer is you fucking don't. So in my opinion, I always split the lifts up into separate sectors to allow the spine to have some time to regenerate. Again, you can't do what you can't recover from. I find that guys that do compound lifts on a consistent basis all the time have very short careers. Like insanely short, like two, three, four years, because the body just says, you know what? I'm fucking done. And you're not going to listen to me. So I'm going to start throwing all these red flags. Versus, I think if you train compressive movements, you pick one massive compressive movement per workout. And then almost everything else that you design around it is traction based or at least minimal. What do you mean by compression and traction? So compression, think about this. If I have forces that are smashing my back downward, that's compressive. If I have forces that are pulling my back apart, That's traction. So instead of squatting one week, I would belt squat because now the belt's pulling down on my pelvis and letting my lumbar have traction. If I'm doing 
glute ham raises and 45 degree back extensions, there's no vertical pressure on my spine. But if I deadlift, there is. Same muscle groups. So the point is, you start looking at all these exercises and classifying them as compressive or traction based. So for every compressive movement, you should do two to three traction based movements. If you do that, you'll lift your whole life. That's why I'm 43 and I can still. That makes sense. You're compressing, then you're contracting, you're traction. pulling. So in the water. winning warm up, I smart. decompress before I even compress. So I'll do belt squats or GHRs or reverse hypers before I squat. Not heavy, but enough to get some stimulation and traction. Then I compress myself with a squat, and then I go back to non-compressive or traction-based movements after the squat to regenerate. Sounds great. It's fucking simple, but nobody thinks that way. They just think classic movements. Start thinking of pressure gradients. Is this vertically pushing on areas that are known to be problems, which is lumbar, sacrum. So in my opinion, you're absolutely on the right track. Do not delve and squat on the same day, especially if it's in your ballpark and you're not a fucking competitive lifter. The shit. Yeah. Think restoration and think muscle activation without compression, and that's going to start designing your whole program for you. If you just think of those things, your program will be smarter than 95% of the people that go to the gym. Awesome, man. We're going to do some lifting later today. Three o'clock. We're going to yeah. bring it. All right, man. Thank you so much for <laughs> yeah. uh, coming in. We no enjoyed problem. having you. No problem. All right. Pleasure. It's Matt Wenning. I will see you guys later.